Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please announce our agenda for this morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear six items for your consideration and one presentation. First, you will receive a preliminary report from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau on its investigation into the false emergency alert that occurred in Hawaii on January 13, 2018. Second, you will consider a second report and order and second, <coughs> excuse me, order on recon to enhance the effectiveness of wireless emergency alerts, including improving the geographic accuracy of these alerts. Third, you will consider an order addressing the remaining issues raised by parties challenging the Commission's orders implementing the Connect America Phase 2 auction, Auction 903, in which service providers will compete to receive support of up to $1.98 billion to offer voice and broadband service in unserved high-cost areas. Fourth, you will consider a public notice establishing procedures for the Connect America Fund Phase 2 auction, which will award up to $1.98 billion over 10 years to service providers that commit to offer voice and broadband services to fixed locations in unserved high-cost areas. Fifth, you will consider an order to establish an Office of Economics and Analytics. Sixth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking proposing to eliminate the requirement that broadcast licensees and permittees routinely submit paper copies of contracts and other documents to the FCC as specified in Section 73.6.3613 of the Commission's rules. And seventh, you will consider an enforcement action. This is your agenda for today. Please note item 7 on the agenda as listed in the January 23, 2018 Sunshine Notice entitled Amendment of Parts 27, 54, 73, 74, and 76 of the Commission's Rules to Delete Rules Made Obsolete by the Digital Transition was adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. First on your, agenda to, on your agenda today is a preliminary report presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. <laughs> Ms. Folks, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Earlier this month, on the morning of January 13th, people throughout Hawaii were alerted on their televisions, radios, and wireless phones of an imminent ballistic missile attack. The warning unleashed widespread panic and fear. The alert was issued by the state of Hawaii through the emergency alert system and the wireless emergency alert system. But the warning was a false alert. Compounding this problem, it took 38 minutes for the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency to issue a corrected alert. As Chairman Pai stated, this false alert was unacceptable. He immediately directed the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau to investigate the incident with the goal of understanding how it happened and how to help prevent such an incident from happening again. America's emergency alert systems provide timely and life-saving information to the public, and we must ensure that these systems remain effective. This includes maintaining the public's confidence so that when an emergency alert is issued, the public heeds its call. Today, the, pub, the Bureau presents a preliminary report on its investigation. Joining me here today are Nikki McGinnis, Deputy Bureau Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, James Wiley, an attorney advisor in the Bureau's Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division, and Justin Kane, Deputy Chief of the Bureau's Operations and Emergency Management Division. These talented folks, along with the rest of the Bureau's alerting team, has produced an incredible amount of excellent work on this investigation, the wireless emergency alert item that will be considered shortly, and my recent testimony before the Senate Commerce Committee, all within a very, 
very, very short time frame. To Nikki, James, and the rest of the alerting team, as well as others within the Bureau who have helped on these projects in recent weeks, thank you. You have my pride and appreciation, and I am grateful that you are part of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau family. I would also like to recognize Ryan Hagihara, field agent with the Enforcement Bureau, who assisted James and Justin when they were on the ground in Hawaii as part of this investigation. James will present the report. Thank you, Chief Folks, and thank you for your kind words. Good morning, Chairman Pai and Commissioners. Uh, as Chief Folks said, on January 13th, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency initiated a false ballistic missile alert using the wireless emergency alert system, which delivers alerts to consumers' mobile devices, as well as the emergency alert system, which delivers alerts through television and radio. In investigating the false alert, the Bureau to date has interviewed representatives of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency in person in Honolulu and received a demonstration of how its alert origination software initiates alerts and tests. In addition, we have interviewed representatives of wireless providers that offer service to Hawaii, the president of the Hawaii Broadcasters Association, and the Hawaii State Emergency Communications Committee, alert origination software vendors, including the vendor that supplies alerting software to the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, other state and local emergency management agencies, and key stakeholders. So far, we have generally been pleased with the level of cooperation we have received, including from the leadership of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Unfortunately, the individual who transmitted the false alert has refused to speak with us. However, late last week, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency provided us with information from a written statement made by this individual shortly after the incident, which helped to improve our understanding of the events that led to the false alert. By way of background, and to provide context to what happened on January 13th, Hawaii has been actively testing its alert and warning capabilities over the past year. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's ballistic missile defense drill aims to simulate a real event. It begins with a mock call from a warning officer who simulates a call from United States Pacific Command, and it ends with the transmission of a test message to FEMA. Under the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's established drill procedures, the test message should be sent only to FEMA's integrated public alert and warning system, Gateway. It should never actually be transmitted to consumer phones, radios, or televisions. By November 27th of last year, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency had memorialized a checklist of procedures for initiating and conducting the ballistic missile defense drill. It had been refined over months of testing through iterative practice and feedback on lessons learned. And the agency was regularly running the ballistic missile defense drill as a no-notice drill, meaning it was commencing the drills without prior notice to the warning officers who initiate the alerts in order to better simulate actual emergency conditions. The final version of the checklist that guided the agency through its ballistic missile defense drill on January 13th was created on January 5th. I will now walk you through a timeline of the events as we currently understand them that led to the initiation of the false alert. In the early morning hours of January 13th, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's midnight shift conducted a ballistic missile defense drill without incident. The supervisor of the midnight shift also decided to run a no-notice version of the drill during the transition to the day shift. The midnight shift supervisor specifically decided to drill at shift change in order to help train the day shift warning officers for a ballistic missile defense scenario at a time when it would be challenging to properly respond. At 8 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency conducted its regularly scheduled shift change. When the supervisor of the day shift entered the agency, the supervisor of the midnight shift orally communicated the intention to conduct the ballistic missile preparedness drill. But there was a miscommunication the incoming day shift supervisor thought that the midnight shift supervisor intended to conduct a drill for the midnight shift warning officers only, those that were ending their shift, not for the day shift officers, those beginning their shift. 
As a result, the day shift supervisor was not in the proper location to supervise the day shift warning officers when the ballistic missile defense drill was initiated. At 8.05 a.m., the, the midnight shift supervisor initiated the drill by placing a call to the day shift warning officers, pretending to be U.S. Pacific Command. The supervisor played a recorded message over the phone. The recording began by saying, exercise, 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 language that is consistent with the beginning of the script for the drill. After that, however, the recording did not follow the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's standard operating procedures for this drill. Instead, the recording included language scripted for use in an emergency alert system message for an actual live ballistic missile alert. It thus included the sentence, this is not a drill. The recording ended by saying again, exercise, exercise, exercise. Three on-duty warning officers in the agency's watch center received this message simulating a call from U.S. Pacific Command on speakerphone. According to a written statement from the day shift warning officer who initiated the alert, as relayed to the Bureau by the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, the day shift warning officer heard, this is not a drill, but did not hear, exercise, exercise, exercise. According to the written statement, the day shift warning officer therefore believed that the missile threat was real. At 8.07 a.m., this officer responded by transmitting a live incoming ballistic missile alert to the state of Hawaii. The day shift warning officer used software to send the alert. Specifically, they selected the template for a live alert from a drop-down menu containing various live and test alert templates. The alert origination software then prompted the warning officer to confirm whether they wanted to send the message. The prompt read, are you sure you want to send this alert? The warning officers who heard the recording in the watch center report that they knew that the erroneous incoming message did not indicate a real missile threat, but was supposed to indicate the beginning of an exercise. Specifically, they heard the words, exercise, exercise, exercise. The day shift warning officer seated at the alert origination terminal, however, reported to the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency after the event their belief that this was a real emergency, so they clicked yes to transmit the alert. Because we've not been able to interview the day shift warning officer who transmitted the false alert, we're not in a position to fully evaluate the credibility of their assertion that they believed there was an actual missile threat and intentionally set, sent the live alert, as opposed to believing that it was a drill and accidentally sending out the live alert. But it is worth noting that they, actual, that they accurately recalled after the event that the announcement did say, this is not a drill. At 8.08 a.m., the mobile device of the warning officer who transmitted the alert sounded the wireless emergency alert attention signal, distinct audible tones that announce a wireless emergency alert, providing the first indication to those in the watch center that an actual alert had been transmitted to the public. At 8.09 a.m., State Adjutant Major General Joe Logan, director of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, notified Hawaii Governor David Ige that the agency had transmitted a false alert. At 8.10 a.m., the director of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency communicated to United States Pacific Command that there was no missile launch, confirming what Pacific Command already knew. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency also notified the Honolulu Police Department that there was no missile launch. At 8.12 a.m., the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency used its alert origination software to cancel retransmission of the false alert. The cancellation is an instruction to downstream emergency alert system and wireless emergency alert system equipment to cease retransmission. Notably, a cancellation message does not generate an all-clear message. It also does not recall messages that have already been transmitted and displayed on televisions and mobile phones. From 8.13 a.m. to 8.26 a.m., the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency conducted outreach to Hawaii's county emergency management agencies and radio and TV stations to inform them that the alarm was false. But the agency's phone lines also became congested with incoming calls from the public asking about the nature of the alert that they just received. Some calls to the agency did not get through. The agency also notified its staff of the false alert so that they could help respond to community inquiries. At 8.20 a.m., 
the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency posted on its Facebook and Twitter accounts that there was no missile threat to Hawaii. At 8.24 a.m., Hawaii Governor David Ige retweeted the agency's notice that there was no missile threat. The governor has stated that he was unable to do this earlier because he did not know his Twitter password. At 8.27 a.m., the agency staff met to discuss options for sending a corrective second message using the emergency alert system and the wireless emergency alert system. The agency determined that a correction of this false alert best met the criteria of a civil emergency message, which is one of the event codes used to initiate alerts over the emergency alert system. At 8.30 a.m., the agency called FEMA and, on its second attempt to reach FEMA, reached a FEMA IPAWS program management office employee. After 45 seconds, all on the call agreed that the correction met the criteria for use of the civil emergency message event code. At 8.31 a.m., the deputy chief of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's telecommunications branch logged into the agency's alert origination software and created correction messages for the emergency alert and wireless emergency alert systems. At 8.45 a.m., 38 minutes after the false alert, the agency issued a correction over the two alerting systems. Based on our investigation to date, the Bureau believes that a combination of human error and inadequate safeguards contributed to this false alert. With respect to human error, due to a miscommunication between the midnight shift supervisor and the day, and day shift supervisor, the drill was run without sufficient supervision. In speaking with the Bureau, other emergency management agencies stressed the importance of proper drill supervision and that conducting a drill without proper supervision would not be tolerated. Further, the midnight shift supervisor initiated the drill by playing a recording that deviated from the script of the agency's established drill procedure that included the phrase, this is not a drill. And finally, the warning officer at the alert origination terminal apparently failed to recognize that this was an exercise, even though the other warning officers on duty understood that this was not a real emergency. With respect to inadequate safeguards, most importantly, there were no procedures in place to prevent a single person from mistakenly sending a missile alert to the state of Hawaii. While such an alert addressed a matter of the utmost gravity, there was no requirement in place for a warning officer to double check with a colleague or get sign off from a supervisor before sending such an alert. Additionally, the state of Hawaii appears to have been conducting an atypical number of no notice drills which heightened the potential for an error to occur. The Bureau's investigation so far has revealed that while other emergency management agencies use no-notice drills under special circumstances, their common practice is to schedule drills in advance for a set date and time. It is also troubling that Hawaii's alert origination software did not differentiate between the testing and the live production environment. Hawaii's alert origination software allowed users to send both live alerts and test alerts using the same interface and the, and the same login credentials after clicking a button that simply confirmed, are you sure you want to send this alert? In other words, the confirmation prompt contained the same language irrespective of whether the message was a test or an actual alert. The confirmation prompt also did not offer the officer another opportunity to review the text that is about to be sent. Further, Hawaii's reliance on prepared templates stored in their alert origination software made it easy for a warning officer to click through the alert origination process without sufficient focus on the actual text of the alert message that he or she was about to send. In contrast, the Bureau's investigation so far has revealed that common industry practice is to host the live alert production environment on a separate user-selectable domain at the login screen or through a separate application. Other alert origination software also appears to provide clear visual cues that distinguish the test environment from the live production environment, including the use of watermarks, color coding, and unique numbering. Once the false alert was sent, the error was worsened by the delay in authoritatively correcting the misinformation. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency had not anticipated the possibility of issuing a false alert and, as such, had failed to develop standard procedures for its response. 
it first sent out a corrective message using social media, rather than the same alerting systems that it used to transmit the false alert. Indeed, the agency was not immediately prepared to issue a correction using these systems. The agency also did not maintain redundant and effective means to communicate with key stakeholders during emergencies. The Bureau is pleased that the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency has already taken steps to help ensure that an incident like this never happens again. It has created a new policy that supervisors must receive advance notice of all future drills. It will require two credentialed warning officers to sign in and validate the transmission of every alert and test. It has created a false alert correction template for emergency alert system and wireless emergency alert system messages so that warning officers are more readily prepared to conduct, excuse me, to correct a false alert should one ever occur again. It has requested that its alert origination software vendor integrate improvements into the next iteration of its software to more clearly delineate the test environment from the live production environment, helping to safeguard against false alerts. And finally, it has stopped all future ballistic missile defense drills pending the conclusion of its own investigation. That said, there is more work to be done. The Bureau will continue its investigation and issue a final report, including recommended measures to safeguard against false alerts and to mitigate their harmful effects if they do occur. And once we have developed these recommended measures, we intend to partner with FEMA to engage in stakeholder outreach and encourage implementation of these best practices. Among other avenues, we are considering convening a roundtable with stakeholders in the emergency alerting ecosystem to discuss the lessons that should be learned from this incident, as well as developing a joint webinar with FEMA to further educate stakeholders. And of course, as always, the Bureau stands ready to implement additional actions as directed by the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wiley and Ms. Folks, uh, for that presentation. We will now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. And uh, first, I uh, would uh, like to thank uh, the Bureau for such a very, very, very quick and comprehensive um, report. Uh, this is a, a, a extremely uh, a serious issue um, because the false ballistic or missile alert in Hawaii should be a wake-up call for all stakeholders involved in emergency communications. We cannot simply dismiss this as being an inadvertent mistake that only public officials in Hawaii need to address. This incident should and is, I hear, serving as a catalyst for every state and locality to review their emergency alert processes. Every community should be doing more to prevent an issuance of a false alert. But if and when a false alert is ever sent again, the technical capability to immediately send a correction should be in place, and the protocols on how to go about that should be clearly defined. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have more questions than I do a statement, but I, I do want to say it is astounding that no one was hurt in this instance. This could have been a cataclysmic catastrophe uh, of utmost importance. And so I, I did want to check on one of the points that you made. Uh, you had highlighted, and it was raised in a, in a Washington Post article regarding the governor uh, and, and, and FEMA's, uh, excuse me, the Hawaii and Emergency Management Agency had responded to this uh, Washington Post article and said, I w we had hoped the Commissioner O'Reilly would have waited till the FCC investigators report had come out before commenting um, regarding the, the Twitter password. But nothing uh, you responded today suggests that, that the Washington Post article isn't completely accurate, that the reason that the governor did not respond is because he couldn't find his password. Is that right? That's how it's been reported in the news. Yeah. But, okay. Um, can, Chief, folks, can you help me? I, I watched your testimony in the Senate. And it was very helpful in delineating whose responsibilities were, were whom's or whose. Uh, it, it's correct in saying that FEMA has responsibility for overseeing the preparation of the notifications as it relates to its relationship with the state, local, and other organizations. And our responsibility is to make sure that the notifications uh, work from the communication company side going out. Is that accurate? Is that consistent with your testimony? Um, the FCC is responsible for oh, the um, distribution by the communication service providers. 
FEMA oversees its integrated public alert and warning system, which is um, it, it aggregates alerts coming from the alert originators. The state and local governments uh, decide what the note, what's when to issue the alert over what systems and um, when those alerts would would be issued. So it. it but it's either state, local government, or FEMA that before it gets to the communications company, right? right? And the communications companies, that's when our role kicks in. Is that right? Right. So I, I was wondering, when I read your good work on the um, next steps, a lot of these steps seem to be actually FEMA's responsibility. Is that not accurate? I mean, when it says things, you know, uh, that you mentioned a stakeholders round table was a possibility, and best practices are mentioned here, and safeguards for false alerts, that's all on FEMA's responsibility, and whether they did it or didn't do it, and overseeing the state and local, that, that's not the communication companies. I mean, the communications company's side seems to have worked very well, right? The com- from the communications perspective, the information did get out, whether it was a false information or accurate information, it did get out and the companies themselves did their job. Is that accurate? Yes. So so on the FEMA side and, and looking at the statute that governs this, their responsibility is all of that and it's not our responsibility. Is that a fair? From a statutory perspective, yes. But I, what... That's kind of like a top yeah, level. Statutory what, perspective is usually one right. of the top but ones. What, right. But what we've... What, we've said in this presentation as well as um, what I had said in my testimony is that all the stakeholders involved need to do their part to address these types of issues. The And the FCC is simply performing it, 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 its part. For example, the FCC has in the past served as a convener of stakeholders to identify lessons learned and, 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 best pra- and best practices. We've also taken into account feedback received from state and local governments and FEMA in terms of the policies that we adopt. So on this, your last point there, there is a stakeholder uh, advisory committee created in the law, right, that, that FEMA operates, right? And we're yes. a member of that. Yes. So they have the authority for another couple of years, as I read the statute, for convening that as they see fit. I think the authorization, authorization this is only 18 months old. Right. With so. respect, I mean, they have a, that's right, they have a committee that they've set up under statute um, dealing with their IPOC system. Okay. One last question, um, and, and that was in the presentation it's, it's right to say that, that one of the, the the supervisor of this entire project, if I see, was um, was at home at the time. Is that accurate? At, at 8:31, the supervisor logs in the system to begin to create a false alert, and he was he was at home at the time, right? The supervisor. Is that accurate? Anyway. Maybe follow up with you on that point. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Imagine what you would do if at this very moment on your phone you received the following message. Ballistic missile threat inbound. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Who would be the first person that you'd call? What would you say? And what would you do in the intervening 38 minutes between getting that message and getting another one, saying that the first one was false. Many residents of Hawaii don't have to imagine that scenario. They live through it. Many of them thought those 38 minutes were their last ones. The panic and fear and heartache of those 38 minutes we now believe was due to human error, but also deficient preparation and training. No one should have to go through moments like those, especially if basic competency would have prevented them. The people of Hawaii are justifiably livid. They demand answers, and so do we. I commend the chairman for immediately beginning an investigation into what happened in Hawaii on January 13th. And I thank the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau for all the work you've already put together, for your preliminary findings, for the testifying on this issue and doing it all so quickly. It's shed a lot of light on what's already transpired. 
We will get to the bottom of this incident, and it's incumbent upon all of the relevant agencies of our government to make certain that this doesn't happen again. So thank you again for all your diligent work on this, for the findings you've put together. I look forward to continuing to work with you all on this matter. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Years ago, I had the privilege of working for the people of the state of Hawaii when I served as counsel to the late Senator Daniel Inouye. So I know its residents are graceful and resilient. I'm sure, too, that they are aware, like all of us, of new vulnerabilities in the Pacific. When this incident occurred, I reached out to folks in Hawaii who I had worked with in the past in order to try and understand just what had happened. And they had only harrowing tales to tell. Imagine knowing you had only minutes left to live before everything you hold dear could be destroyed. What would you do? When this threat was over, I'm sure that people in Hawaii held their children a little bit closer. I know I did the same that night. As Senator Brian Schatz said, this system failed miserably. We need to improve it and get it right. Amen. So let's get to work. And that work starts right here with the preliminary report that we produced today. This is thanks to the chairman swiftly calling for an investigation, which was the right thing to do. It's also thanks to the efforts of our talented Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. What your work reveals is that at many levels, this mistake could have been avoided and its effects could have been mitigated. Now we need to take these facts and use them to improve our emergency alert systems across the board. We can start by considering how this agency can help develop best practices at the local, state, and federal level. Then we need to incentivize their use through the emergency alert system state plans, which are subject to regular filing and review at the FCC. While we're at it, we should address everything from state training to improved user interfaces that reduce the likelihood of error. In addition, we should explore the viability of offering these alerts to audio and video streaming services and the possibility of aligning traditional daisy chain reporting practices with newer federal alert aggregation capabilities. But above all, we need to act with dispatch. We need real changes in place on an accelerated schedule. We should commit right here, right now, to having them in place before the summer begins, because what happened in Hawaii should never happen again. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, as we've heard, the only things that struck the island on January 13th were panic and then outrage, uh, rightly so on each count. And that raised two key questions. What went wrong and what needs to be done to stop a future mistake from happening? Those are the two questions I asked the Public Safety Bureau to immediately investigate when I initiated this investigation on January 13th. And as today's preliminary report demonstrates, the Bureau has made a lot of progress in less than two and a half weeks, very busy weeks, as uh, Chief Folks has pointed out. And the presentation this morning also makes clear that many things went wrong in Hawaii, as we saw from Mr. Wiley's uh, PowerPoint. And I don't say this for the purpose of casting blame or disparaging Hawaiian officials, but we simply need to identify the problems in order to fix them, not just in Hawaii, but anywhere else where they may exist in this country. In my view, the two most troubling things that our investigation thus far has uh, found is that, number one, Hawaii, uh, the Hawaii uh, Emergency Management Agency didn't have reasonable safeguards in place to prevent human error from resulting in the transmission of a false alert. And number two, Hawaii's uh, Emergency Management Agency didn't have a plan for what to do if a false alert was transmitted. Every state and local government that originates alerts needs to learn from these mistakes. Each should ensure that it has adequate safeguards in place to prevent the transmission of false alerts. And each should have a plan in place for how to immediately correct a false alert. This is important because the public needs to be able to trust that when the government issues an emergency alert, it is indeed a credible alert. Otherwise, people won't take alerts seriously and respond appropriately when a real emergency strikes and lives are on the line. 
Now, today's preliminary report, as Mr. Wiley pointed out, is not the end of our work on this issue, but rather the beginning. In the weeks to come, the Bureau will produce a final report on this incident. And the FCC will work in collaboration with federal, state, and local officials to explore appropriate actions and or best practices. We want to minimize both the chances of future false alerts being issued, as well as the impact of any such false alerts. I, too, would like to thank all of the witnesses who have cooperated with our investigation. I'd also like to thank Senator Brian Schatz and Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa of Hawaii for speaking with me on that day and in days subsequent. And most of all, I would like to thank the Bureau's staff for the expertise, speed, and tenacity that they have brought to bear on this important task. James Wiley and Justin Kane were our dogged on-the-ground investigators in Hawaii, as well as field agent Ryan Hagihara, and they've been ably supported and assisted by uh, Rochelle Cohen, Greg Cook, Lisa Folks, Megan Henry, and Nikki McGinnis. Thanks to all of you for your hard work, and thanks in advance for the efforts to come. Oh, with that, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the second item on your agenda, entitled Wireless Emergency Alerts, Amendment of Part 11 of the Commission's Rules Regarding the Emergency Alert System, will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security. Once again, Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, Ms. Folks, whenever you and your uh, team is ready. Are ready. Thank you. Good morning again, Good morning. Chairman Pai and Commissioners. The Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is pleased to present a second report and order and second order on reconsideration that would enhance the effectiveness of wireless emergency alerts. When the Wireless Emergency Alerts Program launched in 2012, participating wireless providers were generally required to send alerts to a geographic area no larger than the county or counties affected by an emergency. Oftentimes, however, an emergency affects an area smaller than a county. To address that, as of last November, all participating wireless providers are now required to transmit alerts to a geographic area that best approximates the area affected by an emergency, even if it is smaller than a county. Today's order would improve geotargeting accuracy even further by requiring participating wireless providers to deliver alerts to an area that matches the target area specified by alert originators with an overreach of no more than one-tenth of a mile. This enhanced geotargeting standard would allow emergency managers to send alerts to only those phones located in areas affected by an emergency without disturbing others. Recent natural disasters in Texas, California, and Puerto Rico, among other places, have demonstrated the need for public safety personnel to communicate potentially life-saving information to targeted areas, including orders to evacuate or shelter in place due to wildfires or hurricanes. The enhanced geotargeting requirement before you today would allow for the kind of precise alerting, prevent over-alerting, and encourage the use of wireless alerts during times of crisis. If adopted, this and other improvements in today's order would make wireless emergency alerts an even more effective tool for emergency managers to keep their communities safe. Joining me at the table are Nikki McGinnis, Megan Henry and James Wiley, Attorney Advisors in the Bureau of Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division, and Dr. Rasul Safavian, Engineer in the Bureau's Policy and Licensing Division. I also want to thank the other bureaus and offices within the agency, particularly our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel, who have provided their expertise and counsel throughout this process. Megan will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Pai and Commissioners. As Chief Folks explained, today's second report and order takes important steps towards improving the utility of wireless emergency alerts, or WIA, as a life-saving tool. First, the order would require participating wireless providers to deliver WIA messages to an area that matches the target area specified by the alert originator. We define matching the target area as delivering an alert message to 100% of the target area with no more than one-tenth of a mile overshoot. This requirement would apply to all new devices and all existing devices that are capable of being updated to support this match standard. 
we expect that participating wireless providers would match the target area in all instances, except where they're technically incapable of doing so. In those very limited circumstances, for example, when a consumer turns off the location services on their device, wireless providers would be required to best approximate the target area. In recognition of the urgent need to ensure that members of the public receive only the alert messages that are relevant to them, and to give emergency managers the tools to communicate life-saving information to those specifically affected by an emergency, we would require participating wireless providers to comply with this rule by November 30th, 2019. The order would also adopt new consumer disclosure requirements to ensure that members of the public are aware of the availability and benefits of enhanced geotargeting at the point of sale. Second, the order would require wireless providers to preserve WIA messages on mobile devices for at least 24 hours or until they are deleted by the user. Preserving alert messages on the device will allow members of the public to go back and review life-saving information, such as the location of shelters and supply distribution units and emergency hotline numbers. This capability is especially important given the Commission's recent adoption of rules that allow for longer WIA messages that include clickable links and phone numbers. Third, the order would define what constitutes in whole and in part participation in WIA. Wireless providers would participate in whole if they provide WIA service on all the mobile devices they offer at the point of sale and in the entirety of their geographic service area. They would participate in part if they provide WIA service in some but not all of their geographic service area or on some but not all of the mobile devices that they offer at the point of sale. These definitions will provide additional clarity to industry, emergency managers, and the public about the availability of WIA service. Finally, the second order on reconsideration would align the deadline for implementing Spanish language alerting with the deadline for implementing longer 360 character length messages. In doing so, we recognize that alerts in Spanish can require more characters than equivalent alerts in English, and that harmonizing the deadlines at May 1, 2019 will allow wireless providers to conduct software testing for these two features at the same time. The Bureau recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Henry, we'll now proceed to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Whether it is text to 911, wireless location accuracy, or promoting the reliability of public safety communications, my approach when it comes to public safety issues has been shaped by three guiding principles. People with accessibility and access challenges must benefit. We should do all we can to educate consumers about these safety benefits, and collaboration among all stakeholders works better than litigation. Frederick Douglass, one of the most influential Af Americans in, of the 19th century, is known to have said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. With African American History Month just days away, I find this to be a particularly fitting quote to aptly describe most of the public safety proceedings I have participated in over the past eight years. Typically, proceedings start with the commission setting an ambitious goal to improve these services. Then, in many cases, the communications industry pushes back on certain details. This is followed by the five of us not agreeing on all of the policy details. But in the end, these struggles and collaboration among stakeholders have resulted in progress and improvements to emergency communications. The same can be said for wireless emergency alerts, OES. Wireless car carriers voluntarily participate and the WIA system enables authorized alert originators at the federal, tribal, state, and local levels to warn the public about all levels of emergencies. First deployed in April of 2012, and thanks to the collaborative effort by industry and the public safety community, the WIA system has issued more than 33,000 emergency alerts. We have worked over the past few years to more precisely target those alerts to cell phone users located in the exact area where the emergency exists. 
The risk here is that those who repeatedly get alerts which are not relevant to them may one day ignore an alert that directly impacts their safety, and that would be extremely unfortunate. This is why back in September of 2016, we sought comment on requiring the industry to go beyond the current geo-targeting standard and more closely match the target area that an alert originator transmits. That further noted, notice demonstrated again that despite differences on specific policy details, my colleagues and I considered the industry's challenges and worked towards supporting this goal. Today's order marks an important milestone because it follows through on the previous administration's enhanced geotargeting proposal and requires the industry to meet the enhanced standard by November 30th of 2019. I must admit that I had concerns about certain aspects of the draft originally circulated earlier this month. But I am pleased to report that I can now support the item because we were able to compromise on a few key areas. The order originally stated that a participating wireless company's network infrastructure could resort to a less accurate standard if it were technically incapable of matching a target area. I was concerned that the term could become a loophole. My colleagues agreed to the request to clarify that technically incapable does not include circumstances when a carrier's own failure to adequately maintain or upgrade its network or devices makes it unable to meet this standard. I want to commend APCO, the New York City Emergency Management Office, and others for their strong advocacy on this issue. In addition, the original draft order did not amend the subscriber notification rule to keep pace with the technical changes we are adopting today. Currently, consumers must be notified at point of sale if wireless companies do not offer WIAs at all or if they offer WIAs only in part. If we really believe that more precise geotargeting alerts are important to keep people safe, then we should give all wireless customers the ability to choose more precise geo-targeting devices and services. Consumers cannot make that choice if they do not have adequate notification. So I thank my colleagues for agreeing to amend the rule to make clear that consumers must also be notified about the, ex the extent to which wireless companies offer enhanced geo-targeting alerts. Finally, I was concerned that the initial draft had no mention of multimedia information in wireless emergency alerts. The D September 2016 further notice specifically sought comment on this issue, and the New York City Emergency Commission made a compelling case that it would have been very helpful if the alert about the Chelsea bombing in 2016 had included a photo of the suspect. So I asked that the item include a further notice on multimedia information in these alerts. Although my colleagues would not agree to a further notice, I am pleased that they are willing to support directing the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau staff to issue a public notice to further develop the record on the subject. So for all of the reasons I have stated, this order has my support. I thank Lisa Folks and the dedicated staff of the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau for the work on this order and my colleagues for working with me on such a critical proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Everyone should be able to agree that providing agencies with the flexibility to pinpoint their wireless emergency alerts to specific areas where there is a threat is an incredibly useful function. Public safety entities and industry are supportive of such geo-targeting capabilities, and so am I. Therefore, I'm generally in favor of today's order. My concerns, however, center on the Commission's continuous need to mandate technologies before they are ready in time frames that don't seem to be in line with the record. The notice that led to today's item, along with the Commission's Communications, Security, Reliability, and Interoperability, Interoperability Council, commonly known as CISRIC, recommended that compliance should occur 42 months after adoption of the Commission order. The wireless industry said that they could then probably do it faster <coughs> Excuse me, and suggested 36 months. 
Today's item adopts an inexplicable 22 months timeline based on no record evidence that this is actually achievable. Although wireless providers have stated that they will try to meet this aggressive timeline, they've also stated that it will be incredibly challenging. Basically, the stars must align just right to make this happen in this time. While I understand that public safety entities want geo-targeting now, you cannot wish technology into existence. As the record reflects, further consideration is needed regarding how to effectuate geo-targeting, including such basics as the need for software or hardware changes and updated and new standards. This doesn't happen overnight. In fact, the standard setting bodies are still finalizing the last set of WIA changes the Commission passed, including Spanish language messages and 360 character alerting requirements. Before these are even completed, and geotargeting relies on the ability to send these longer alerts, we are adopting new rules that will add additional requirements for standard setting bodies to work out. Based on the draft that was made public, the Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Solutions, or ADIS, recently identified 25 standards that must be developed or modified to make geotargeting possible. Hopefully, this will be the end for a while. But let's not forget that a key priority for our standard setting bodies should be setting standards for 5G. I also want to be clear that the industry should be given the opportunity to figure out the best means to implement geotargeting. It is paramount in the context of public safety that industry ensures that whatever means or technology they pick is tested and works. They should not be forced to cut corners or pick a lesser solution to meet an aspirational deadline. We went down this road for phase two location accuracy and it didn't work out well. Therefore, if standards are delayed and industry needs more time to successfully deploy geotargeting, I'll be supportive of extending the deadline. For this reason, I'm pleased that the chairman agreed to my request to add language to the item that the commission will entertain a waiver of the 22-month deadline if the standards process is prolonged. Ultimately, we must remember that this is a voluntary program. We certainly do not want providers opting out of the program because they cannot set standards and integrate this functionality in 22 months. This brings me to the cost-benefit analysis. While I remain skeptical of the flawed value of a statistical life metric, and while some assumptions are made with little to no support, I appreciate the efforts by the chairman's office and staff to improve the, this part of the item. Going forward, we should work towards improving cost-benefit analysis to ensure that they are based in fact and that there is actual proof or a high probability that the stated benefits will actually accrue from the burdens we impose. I hope under the new Office of Economic and, Anal and Analytics, which we established in a separate item today, we can work on a framework in which any proposed rule must be shown to have a statistically significant likelihood of correlation or causation to a significant, to a suggested benefit. Excuse me. Further, I want to thank the chairman for incorporating some of my additional edits, such as adding language to ensure that for device-based solutions, the coordinate points and visible text fit within the 360 characters. I also want to thank the staff for all of their hard work that they dedicated to this issue, especially given their intense focus on the other issues in Hawaii over the last many weeks. I thank you so very much, and I will vote to approve the item. Thank you, Commissioner Riley. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Wireless emergency alerts save lives. From a National Weather Service warning about an approaching hurricane to amber alerts that bring a child home safely. Emergency managers have sent more than 33,000 alerts aimed at keeping the public safe. But an ineffective WIA system is no system at all. If emergency managers cannot count on the system to deliver their messages on time and to the intended area, or if the public loses trust and we as reliability, officials and the public will opt out. And a system that delivers few alerts to a dwindling audience becomes an afterthought rather than a life-saving tool. Recent events in California and Hawaii remind us of the urgency of improving WIA. The massive wildfires that swept through Northern California in October caused the evacuation of tens of thousands of residents. The WIA system was designed for precisely this sort of situation, when lives and property are at stake, when a large number of Americans need to receive instructions, and when time is of the essence. Yet there are reports that officials in California chose not to use WIA because it lacks precise targeting. They fear the unintended consequences of alerting too many residents and telling them to evacuate. And as we just heard in the report, 
the false alert in Hawaii resulted in 38 minutes of panic and confusion, so we must continue to exercise our oversight authority. Now, our experience with WIA over the last five years and the significant submissions from the public safety community in the record support the Commission's actions today. We now require that WIAs match the originator's target area to reduce the likelihood of overwarning and warning fatigue. We require that messages be preserved for 24 hours so that the public can review and share alerts after they've been sent. And we provide guidance on how legacy networks and devices can continue to comply with our rules. And in selecting the new deadlines, the Commission has attempted to balance the urgency we all feel to improve the WIA system with the speed at which technology and standards are developing. I'm confident the Commission will continue to work with all stakeholders on implementing these upgrades and do so based on the recognition that working quickly and effectively together will save lives. So thank you to the staff of the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau for all your work on this item. I'm pleased to support it. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Our emergency alert systems were first designed for war and then rebuilt for peace. In the wake of September 11th attacks, we reimagined them again for the smartphone era. And today, wireless emergency alerts are a powerful tool to quickly send messages to people in imminent danger. 90 characters to the right person at the right time in the right place can mean the difference between life and death. These messages have already saved countless lives and helped avert many more tragedies. This past year, however, exposed too many shortcomings in our emergency alert systems. We saw this quite clearly earlier this month with the harrowing false alert announcing a ballistic missile attack in Hawaii. And on top of this, last year was one of the most devastating on record for natural disasters in the United States. California experienced its most destructive and largest wildfire season, burning 1.2 million acres of land and killing 46 people. Hurricane Harvey shattered rainfall records for a single tropical storm, flooding parts of Texas with more than four feet of rain. Puerto Rico is still recovering from when Hurricane Maria made landfall on the island four months ago. More than 1,000 people died in the storm and its aftermath. 30% of the island remains without power. And Puerto Rico is still waiting for a report and plan for communications recovery from this agency. In too many cases last year, wireless emergency alerts failed to perform. In California and Texas, for instance, emergency services were unable to transmit these messages because they were unable to target them accurately enough to ensure that they would help those in danger and not cause panic beyond the broader area of concern. That's troubling. Moreover, it's a problem when repeated imprecision of these alerts causes those who receive them to disregard warnings. And we've seen this happen before with destructive weather in areas where tornado sirens have been sounded too many times over too large of an area, overstating the scope of danger. That's why in November of last year, I urged the FCC to act swiftly to require more granular geotargeting before the next disaster compels us to do so. For this reason, I fully support the actions the agency is taking today. The rules we adopt here can significantly increase the precision of wireless emergency alerts. As a result, they reduce the danger of over-alerting, making their use more effective, more efficient, and more likely to save lives. It's important that we do not stop here. We need to watch technical issues impacting the targeted availability of wireless emergency alerts and be on guard for ways these issues can be resolved so that everyone gets the emergency warning they need. We also need to consider multimedia use and alerts, many-to-one feedback, and multilingual messaging. The record on all of these issues is already robust. So let's do something bold. Let's take them on now before the next disaster or crisis compels us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. When disaster strikes, it is essential that Americans in harm's way get reliable information so that they can stay safe and protect their loved ones. 
The Wireless Emergency Alert System, or WIA, is one important tool for emergency managers to quickly convey such information, such as tornado warnings, to the public on their mobile devices. Since WIA became operational in 2012, it has been used over 33,000 times. Recently, WIA was used four times in response to wildfires in Northern California and 16 times more during wildfires around Los Angeles. WIA was also used extensively in all areas affected by recent hurricanes, including 21 alerts sent in Puerto Rico alone. But we've heard that many jurisdictions are hesitant to use WIA because it lacks granularity. That is, people may receive the alert even though they're located well outside of an affected target area. Overbroad alerting can cause public confusion. It can lead some to opt out of receiving alerts altogether, and in many instances it can complicate rescue efforts by unnecessarily causing traffic congestion or overloading call centers. As I said before, people should not miss out on potentially life-saving information just because the alerts system's current brushstroke is too broad. Well, this morning, we address this problem by bringing a finer brush to bear on the canvas. Today's report and order requires participating wireless providers to deliver alerts to match 100% of the target area that overlaps with the wireless provider's network coverage area, with an overshoot of no more than one-tenth of a mile. This rule will help channel alerts to Americans who actually need them. And equally important, this rule will give alert originators the assurance they need to rely on WIA as a valuable tool to help save lives. Indeed, among the many public safety officials who have endorsed this approach, Harris County Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator Francisco Sanchez has said that this rule, and I quote, will be the single most important improvement to the nation's alerts and warnings infrastructure in years. Now, I understand that there is some division over the rule's November 2019 implementation deadline. Some say the schedule is too aggressive. Some say it's not aggressive enough. I think it's just right. On this public safety matter, I favor an approach that I believe is aggressive, aggressive and achievable. And in my view, the record indicates that November 2019 meets this test. In short, this rule, coupled with the other improvements that we adopt today, enabling consumers to retrieve alerts for 24 hours after they are received, clarifying the difference between providers participating in WIA in part versus in whole, and harmonizing the deadline for implementing Spanish language alerting with the deadline for implementing longer 360 character length messages. All of these things will strengthen the WIA system and keep America safer. I, like my colleagues, would also like to thank the staff of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau for all of the hard work and the commitment to serving the public that they have shown. Rochelle Cohen, Greg Cook, Lisa Folks, Megan Henry, Nikki McGinnis, Rasul Savavian, Emily Talaga, and, of course, James Wiley. And from the Office of General Counsel, thanks to David Horowitz, Bill Richardson, and Anjali Singh. With that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenbrussel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda, if you would. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, Item 3, entitled Connect America Fund, ETC Annual Reports and Certifications, Rural Broadband Experiments, Connect America Fund Phase 2 Auction, and Item 4, entitled Connect, Connect America Fund Phase 2 Auction Scheduled for July 24, 2008, and Notice and Filing Requirements and Other Procedures for Auction 903, will be presented jointly by the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. You will hear presentation for both items followed by comments from the bench and a separate vote for each item. Chelsea Fallon, Director of the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, will introduce the items. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Fallon, if you're ready, uh, please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Hi. I'm pleased to present to you today two items that would clear the path for the Commission to move forward with the Connect America Fund Phase 2 auction this summer. The Phase 2 auction will take another significant step towards closing the digital divide for all Americans, including those in rural areas. 
First, the order on reconsideration we present today would address the remaining issues raised by parties challenging the Commission's earlier orders implementing the Phase two auction. Second, the Phase two auction procedures public notice would adopt the application and bidding procedures for the Phase two auction. The Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force would like to acknowledge the team from the Wireline, Tele Wireline Competition Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for their work on these items, as well as our colleagues in the International Bureau and the Offices of Communications Business Opportunities, General Counsel, Managing Director, and Strategic Planning and Policy for their helpful input. With me at the table are Chris Monteith, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Don Stockdale, Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Kirk Berge, Deputy Director of the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, Tom Parisi, Chief of Staff of the Task Force, Heidi Lanko, Attorney Advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Angela Kung, Attorney Advisor in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Heidi will present the order on reconsideration. Thank you, Chelsea. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today's order on reconsideration would resolve the remaining petitions challenging the Commission's Phase two auction implementation decisions. Specifically, the order would uphold the Commission's decisions on weighting bids of different performance levels to balance its preference for higher speeds, higher usage allowance, and lower latency with the objective of maximizing the finite budget. The order would also decline to adopt state-specific bidding weights. Additionally, the order would uphold the Commission's decisions on Phase two auction eligibility requirements, as well as the public interest and deployment obligations of support recipients, while allowing winning bidders to true up the number of locations one year after the auction closes and the order would reaffirm the Commission's commitment to use the Phase two auction budget efficiently by not overbuilding areas where a provider is already offering broadbands. Finally, the order would provide some additional relief for Phase two auction recipients by reducing the cost of maintaining a letter of credit. The Wireline Competition Bureau and the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force recommend adoption of this order and request editorial privileges Ending only to technical and conforming edits. Angela will now present the Phase Two Auction Procedures Public Notice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today's public notice would establish procedures for implementing the Connect America Fund Phase Two Auction. This auction will award up to $1.98 billion over 10 years to service providers that commit to offer voice and broadband services to fixed locations in unserved high-cost areas. The auction would start on July 24, 2018, and the window for filing an application to participate in the auction would run from March 19th to March 30th of 2018. First, the public notice would establish procedures for collecting information in the pre-auction short-form application, which would be used by Commission staff to determine whether an applicant has the technical and financial qualifications to participate in the Phase two auction. This information will be reviewed to assess an, applic an applicant's qualifications to participate and to place bids to provide service at the performance tier and latency combinations selected and will be used to discourage coordinated bidding. To help protect competition in the auction, the public notice would provide detailed guidance on the Commission's rule prohibiting an applicant from communicating bids or bidding strategies to another applicant after the deadline for filing the short form application. Second, the public notice would establish bidding procedures for the Phase two auction. In particular, the public notice would adopt the Commission's proposals to use a multi-round descending clock auction, to use census block groups as the minimum geographic area for bidding in the auction, and to establish reserve prices based on the Connect America cost model with a per location cap for extremely high cost census blocks. To place a bid, a bidder would indicate using the bidding template provided that it is willing to provide service to locations in an eligible area at a specified performance tier and latency for which it qualified and at the support amount implied by a certain clock percentage. 
a bidder would have the option of submitting bids for packages of census block groups as well as the ability to submit proxy bids so that the bidder would not have to manually bid in each round. A bidder would be subject to activity requirements and limitations on its ability to switch bids to different census block groups from round to round. The auction would end after the aggregate support amount of all bids is less than or equal to the total budget and when there is no longer competition for support to any area. Third, the public notice would establish post-auction procedures, including the collection of information from winning bidders to determine whether a winning bidder is technically and financially qualified to meet the relevant phase two public interest obligations for the areas in which it was a winning bidder. Finally, the public notice would make clear that the commission will provide educational materials on the application and bidding processes in advance of the auction, including hands-on opportunities for qualified bidders to learn how the bidding system works. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Wireline Competition Bureau, and Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force recommend adoption of this public notice and request editorial provisions extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kong and Ms. Lankow for those presentations. Uh, we will now proceed to comments from the bench. The comments will pertain to both items. Then, as Ms. Dorch instructed us, we'll move to votes on each item sequentially. Uh, so we'll start with comments from committee. Hey, that is <laughs> trolltastic. Very nicely, <laughs> nicely done. Are you seriously just no <laughs> Focusing on my own here. Okay. So. <laughs> We will now proceed to Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner Clyburn. <laughs> when will high-speed broadband reach my community? Month after month, year after year, I've been asked that question by hundreds of consumers longing to be part of the digital economy. Consumers who are spending hundreds of dollars on a cellular hotspot each month those who have been quoted tens of thousands of dollars in construction costs just to bring a wire a few hundred feet closer to their home, and others in communities with no Internet at all who have been told for years that the business case just does not exist for bringing them service. Today, we take another step forward in our ability to answer that question for the millions of consumers who currently lack access to high-speed fixed broadband service. Demographic data shows that most of these individuals live in areas marked by persistent poverty, communities that would benefit the most from connectivity, areas that are populated by those who are cut off from robust job opportunities, places that remain at a marked disadvantage when it comes to education, health care, government services, and civic participation. Today, we act as a full commission in laying out the groundwork for an auction that kicks off later this year, which will, in the foreseeable future, bring hope to those currently stuck on the wrong side of the digital divide. One thing I have consistently sought in this quest is to make it easier for smaller providers to participate in this competitive auction. Why? Because more bidders more often mean both a bigger and better bang for our universal service buck and a better targeted service for local consumers. Two years ago, I asked that we allow smaller banks, including community banks, to provide letters of credit and for enabling certain parties to provide audited financial statements after being selected as a winning bidder in the auction instead of before and the creation of a flexible process to enable entities to use a range of technologies to provide service in unserved areas because greater participation is more often better for us all. Fast forward to this item. And again, the need called for more changes to enable smaller entities to more fully participate in the auction. I am pleased that we ease some of the burden small providers face including challenging financial qualifications and the use of consultants. I am also pleased that we put in place the means for robust educational efforts that could uniquely benefit smaller providers. Yet I find myself still having to concur in part. I am disappointed that we were unable to use smaller geographic units than census block groups 
And despite our unified desire as a commission to spur deployment on tribal lands, we do not take any action here either. The FCC's 2016 Broadband Progress Report found that more than 68% of Americans living on tribal lands in rural areas lack access to fixed broadband speeds of 25 megabits down and 3 megabits up that we do nothing additional to incent tribal broadband speaks volumes. It is also cold comfort to me that many of these companies winning auction monies will be the only game in town and that if by chance they engage, those companies engage in blocking, throttling, or paid power prioritization, there will be nowhere for those consumers to turn. The majority's decision last month to dismantle net neutrality protection is to blame for this uncertainty yet. I am inspired by states like Montana and New York that make clear of their intent to protect their consumers when the federal government has chosen not to do so. Nonetheless, to the dedicated public service on the servants on the Rural Broadband Task Force and the Wireline Competition Bureau, I thank you for your unwavering commitment to universal service and for focusing on how to ensure that all Americans have access to the promise that broadband brings. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like your cup as well. You, you might be the one person who actually likes Burger King coffee. I've <laughs> never heard someone say, I need some Burger King coffee. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> With these two items, the full commission completes its remaining tasks to finalize the Connect America Fund Phase 2 auction. The work on this auction has been a substantial undertaking spanning multiple chairmanships. It will be the first auction of ongoing universal service support using a multi-round reverse auction format, a structure I've strongly advocated for years. In fact, I recall drafting amendments on behalf of members of Congress to require reverse auctions for FCC high-cost programs back in 2005. Therefore, I'm pleased that this long-awaited action will soon come to pass. I do remain concerned about the impact of certain decisions on participation in the auction. In particular, I still believe that the weights assigned to different service tiers will tip the scales towards funding gigabit service in fewer communities at enormous cost while leaving many more unserved Americans with no broadband option whatsoever for many years to come. The waiting decision was made in part to encourage providers of fiber-based broadband to participate in the auction, and I truly hope they do so. A successful auction will depend on the broadest possible participation, but with some of those same providers expressing concern about the complexity of the auction, criticizing the FCC for excluding areas that our data shows are now served, or inappropriately criticizing Chairman Pai's commitment to rural broadband in America, we cannot take their interests for granted. At the same time, the decisions to unduly penalize other technologies, especially satellite service, could have a negative impact on participation, not only in this auction, but in the Remote Areas Fund auction as well. This is not the balance I had hoped for, and therefore I must concur on the failure to reconsider the, and recalibrate the auction weights. In general, however, I am supportive of the policy decisions and procedures set forth in, this, in these items. I'm particularly encouraged by the agency's efforts to ensure that our universal service decisions are based on accurate data. For example, when commenters raised concerns, which I shared, regarding potential shortfalls in the number of locations supposedly available in eligible areas, we were able to work together to reach an appropriate solution. Support recipients will be able to provide evidence subject to potential audit of the actual number of locations. If a number is less than what has been estimated, there will be a proportional reduction in support. Now it's up to the would-be participants to thoroughly examine the rules and procedures aided by education and outreach from our good staff, with short-form applications due in March and the auction commencement scheduled for July 24th, potential applicants should waste no time in undertaking the necessary due diligence to determine whether, where, and to what extent that they will participate in the auction. I look forward to the auction commencement and will hope that it will be successful, bringing broadband access to additional unserved Americans who would not otherwise <coughs> receive service. But make no mistake, completion of this action and auction, like the many steps before, will not end the Commission's efforts to bring broadband to the farthest reaches of our nation. 
I will vote to approve in part and concur in part, and I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Riley. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Broadband means jobs, means opportunities for millions of Americans around the country. That's why I've been focused at the commission on updating and reforming our infrastructure deployment rules. When we remove regulatory barriers, we make it easier for providers to extend broadband to even more communities. But for large parts of the country, streamlining alone is not going to be enough. Without additional support, too many Americans will remain on the wrong side of the digital divide. So today we reaffirm our commitment to bring the benefits of broadband to all Americans. The rules we finalized today will allow us to make nearly $2 billion available over the next decade to help deliver broadband and voice service to areas that would otherwise be uneconomical to serve. And the schedule we adopt today will allow us to kick off the auction this summer. The procedures we've put in place will also help maximize the value that the American people get out of this program. For instance, we target support to unserved areas, which ensures that finite universal service funds are used where the need for them is greatest. And we include safeguards to address instances where our model might overpredict the number of customer locations. We also incentivize prudent spending by using a first-of-its-kind reverse auction, which will award support to providers with relatively lower costs. And as both the order and the public notice make clear, we allow a range of providers in technologies from fiber to fixed wireless and satellite to compete, recognizing that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to getting broadband to unserved communities. So I believe this commission is now on the right path to removing the regulatory barriers, which will help incent greater broadband deployment. But in those areas of the country where challenges persist, this auction will build on the good work we've done so far to make sure that no community gets left behind. I want to thank the staffs of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force for your hard work on these items. I join my colleagues in supporting them. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Mark your calendar. Today we put in place the final pieces of a $2 billion reverse auction of universal service support that will kick off on July 24, 2018. This effort has been many years in the making, and it's exciting because with these decisions, we are taking steps into the future of high-cost universal service. We are experimenting with new opportunities for providers to build broadband in some of our most rural communities that have been among our most challenging to serve. This forward-thinking effort has my full support. Now, despite my support, I do have one concern that I want to acknowledge. I would have preferred that we worked right now with our state partners like Pennsylvania, who have stepped up and sought out new forms of federal-state collaboration when it comes to universal service. When our state partners express interest in working with us and even offering up their own funds to do so, we should have that conversation. Instead of pursuing it with vigor, we put it off for another day. And going forward, I think we should do better than this. Finally, I want to step back and acknowledge that while this auction will help expand broadband availability to more Americans, it is not the only auction we should be putting on the calendar. We do not now have any major spectrum auction on the commission calendar. Other nations are speeding ahead with plans for auctioning airwaves for the next generation of wireless services. South Korea, for instance, has already announced plans to auction the 28 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz bands between June and October of this year. But in the United States, all we have now is a blitz of bands being discussed in regulatory proceedings. If we want to lead in 5G, we need to take action, and not the misguided effort to nationalize networks recently leaked to the press, but real action. It's time for the FCC to put our next major spectrum auction on the calendar, because we can't rest on our laurels with the universal service auction we announced today. Thank you, Commissioner. The details are as dense as the impact will be profound. We are taking the final commission level steps necessary to kickstart the $2 billion program to deliver fixed broadband to rural America, known as the Connect America Phase 2 or CAF 2 auction. 
And it's about time. Believe it or not, way back in 2011, the FCC said it expected CAF 2 competitive bidding disbursements to, quote, ramp up in 2013. And all the while, rural America has waited. But pushing things off is no longer an option. In August, I said we would hold an auction in mid-2018. And we are keeping that promise. The acute need to close the digital divide is why we got to work on the CAF2 auction immediately once I became chairman. You will recall that in February 2017, only 30 days into my chairmanship, the FCC made several key decisions about this auction's framework. And last August, we adopted the CAF2 comment public notice. With our decisions today, we jumped the last big hurdle before holding a first-of-its-kind universal service reverse auction. Now, I hope that the CAF2 auction will attract a wide variety of providers. We need and we want everyone to participate. Rural telcos, electric cooperatives, cable operators, price cap carriers, satellite companies, and fixed wireless providers. Now, of course, the most cost-effective technology for a particular area will vary. And so regardless of how you deliver connectivity, please take a hard look at participating in the CAF2 auction. Now, to this end, we have done a lot to make sure that the auction is accessible to everyone. We've simplified the bidding options and balanced the design to accommodate both those seeking to extend their networks and those planning larger projects. We've reviewed the financial qualification and letter of credit requirements to enable bidding by smaller companies. We've created flexibility in our model so that bidders won't have to identify every location they plan to serve before the auction even starts. And our terrific staff is working hard to make sure that the bidding interfaces are user-friendly. We'll also be holding several events to give bidders a chance to learn how things work and to get their questions answered. Now, I understand that not everyone got exactly what they wanted in the auction rules and procedures. There are well-intentioned differences on how to best make sure communities get connected. And that's understandable. These calls are not easy. But at the end of the day, the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good, especially when there's no agreement in this context on what perfect is. And I'll remind everyone that CAF2 is only the beginning. In 2019, we will move on to the Remote Areas Fund for those areas still without high-speed broadband. As I said before, rural America has waited long enough. The work from staff on these items has been top-notch and truly Herculean. I want to highlight the work of the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, led by Chelsea Fallon, along with Kirk Berge, Michael Jansen, and Tom Parisi, as well as, his new, as well as its newest member, Nathan Egan. And thanks as well to the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the International Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, the Office of General Counsel, and last but not least, the Office of Managing Director, whose names, as you can see, are listed. They deserve our gratitude for the hard work that went into this item. As I said, we will now vote sequentially. The first item we will vote on is listed as item number three on your agenda, which has the delightful title of Connect America Fund Wireline Competition Docket Number 1090, ETC Annual Report and Certifications, WC Docket Number 1458, Rural Broadband Experiments, WC Docket Number 14-259, Connect America Fund Phase 2 Auction, AU Docket Number 17182. Uh, Commissioner this is, Clyburn. Uh, this is the recon. Is this the recon? Oh, you're just trolling me now. So <laughs> <laughs> Have it your way. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn. <laughs> If you say it again, I'll vote twice. I'll vote out. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Riley. Approve in part and concur in part. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. Uh, the chair uh, votes to approve as well. Item number three is adopted with editorial privileges granted. Uh, we will now move to item number four, which has the title Connect America Fund Phase 2 Auction scheduled for July 2014, uh, July 24th, 2018, wow. notice and filing requirements and other procedures for auction 903, Connect America Fund Phase 2 Auction, AU docket number 17182, Connect America Fund, WC docket number 1090. Commissioner Clyburn? Approve in part and concur in part. Commissioner Riley? Approve. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks again to all of you for the fantastic work, and I look forward to July 24th. It'll be here before we know it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you now take us to item number five on today's agenda?
Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item on your agenda will be presented by the Office of Managing Director and is entitled Establishment of the Office of Economics and Analytics. Mark Stevens, FCC Managing Director, will give the introduction. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Mr. Stevens, welcome to the hot seat, and uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good afternoon. The Office of the Managing Director presents for your consideration an order to establish an Office of Economics and Analytics. I would like to start by thanking the Chairman's Working Group for their months of effort and hard work in support of this order. Seated at the table with me is Wayne Layton, Chief of the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy and Analysis and Team Leader of the Working Group, charged with developing a plan to create the new office. I also want to recognize the members of the working group. The group represents experienced staff from across the FCC, and in addition to Wayne, includes Mindy Ginsberg from OMD, Sasha Javid from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Jay Swartz from the Office of Chairman Pai, Royce Sherlock from the Office of General Counsel, Walt Strack from the International Bureau, and Roger Wook from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Over the course of more than seven months, this working group held 80 meetings with FCC staff and leadership, with former FCC officials, and with current and former officials from other federal agencies. The working group prepared a report that was made public earlier this month, outlining recommendations both for creating the office as well as establishing practices that should be implemented to ensure that the new office can have the greatest impact possible on the FCC's work. Wayne will now present the item. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This order takes several actions to establish and organize an Office of Economics and Analytics. The order proposes to amend the Commission's rules to reflect the new organizational structure, describe the Office's functions and delegated authority, and make other conforming changes. These changes and the creation of this new Office are designed to integrate economics and data analysis into the FCC's rulemakings and other actions in a comprehensive and thorough manner. The key objectives of this proposed organizational change are to expand and deepen the use of economic analysis in the Commission's policymaking, to enhance the development and use of auctions, and to implement consistent and effective agency-wide data practices. To accomplish these objectives, the order would have the office made up of four divisions with responsibilities as follows. First, the Economic Analysis Division will provide analytical and quantitative support as needed to bureaus and offices engaged in rulemakings, transactions, auctions, adjudications, and other matters. Second, the Industry Analysis Division will shift the functions of the Industry Analysis and Technology Division in the Wireline Competition Bureau to the new office. The Industry Analysis Division will serve as the FCC's principal resource in designing and administering significant, economically relevant data collections used by a variety of bureaus and offices. Third, the Auctions Division will shift the functions of the Auctions and Spectrum Access Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau to the new office. The Auctions Division will collaborate closely with the bureaus and offices and serve as the Commission's principal resource for all auction design and implementation issues. Finally, the Data Division will develop and implement best practices, processes, and standards for data management and assist bureaus and offices on specific data analysis projects. We recommend adoption of this order and request editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Layton. Mr. Stevens will now proceed to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. By establishing an Office of Economics and Analytics within the FCC, one might conclude that the Commission is laser-focused on integrating neutral economic analysis into the work of this agency. But what the current administration is actually doing is putting in place a mechanism to justify its own interests while disregarding any analysis that run, runs counter to their views. For example, 
Where was the balanced, detailed economic analysis on the impact of edge providers, small businesses, and consumers when the FCC majority gutted the net neutrality protections last month? What about the analysis the FC majority, C majority relied on when they deregulated the $45 billion business data services market and the recently adopted order authorizing use of next-gen TV standard? Where was the enhanced deep analysis there? These orders represent three colossal market changing shifts that were devoid of any cost-benefit analysis, weighing the cost to cons consumers, both in the loss of services and access costs, against their flimsily philosophical touted benefit. And way pray tell, in this three-page order, is the detailed economic analysis, cost-benefit, that justifies reshuffling economists from their current positions within the various bureaus and offices to this new Office of Economics and Analytics. Will the creation of an office dedicated to economics lead us to look more closely at the economic impact of our actions on consumers and small businesses? We are left only to guess due to the lack of analysis in the draft. As the late Carlos Diaz Alejandro, the most prominent Latin American economist of his generation once said, any economics graduate student can come up with any policy conclusion he desires by building appropriate assumptions into his model. My sense is the majority will continue the mix and bake this deregulatory feeding frenzy with the new office serving as icing on the cake. All the while, disrupting existing staff relationships, pulling employees from their current bureaus where they have established subject matter specific expertise, and plunking them down in a newly created bureaucratic structure. A long time has passed since my days in Dr. Ferry's economics class. A long, long time. But what I learned then is light years away from what is being applied now when it comes to critical rulemakings, transactions, auctions, adjudications, and other relevant matters. If passed this prologue, the next 12 months of this administration, even with new offices, reconstituted titles, and reshuffled staff, will be just like the last. New design, self-serving results, I dissent. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit a longer statement, but I want to say I'm exceptionally pleased to support today's item, <clears throat> which adopts a key process reform idea that I've long advocated, creating an office within the agency focused on economic and, and analytics. Since receiving the Chairman's draft item, I have worked with two goals in mind. First, guaranteeing that this office has enough weight and authority to ensure that it's successful from the outset. Second, ingraining it into the agency procedures to ensure that it outlasts the current commission and remains effective for years to come. In 2011, President Obama issued an executive order requiring all executive agencies to conduct cost-benefit analysis before proposing or adopting regulations. But the FCC, as an independent agency, was excluded from this mandate, and promises made by long-gone chairmen to abide by the directive never materialized. Unfortunately, the practical implications of this failure was a litany of shoddy decisions devoid of economic analysis adopted under previous commissions. For this reason, Chairman Pai proposed the creation of a new Office of Economic and, Anal and Analytics to better align our work with concrete data and facts. When this item was circulated, I made several proposals, which Chairman Pai graciously accepted, to add additional responsibilities for the new office. Paramount to my changes is requiring OEA to prepare and review a rigorous, economically grounded cost-benefit analysis for all rulemakings deemed to have an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more. But ensuring that a cost-benefit analysis is conducted is only a partial victory. We must also ensure that such an analysis is credible and accurate. To achieve this, I advocated requiring OEA to follow the guidelines of OMB Circular A4, which standardizes the way benefits and costs are measured and reported across executive agencies. However, due to the commission and resources that may be involved, I understand that it may be prudent to get the office established before taking this important step. 
To that end, I look forward to continuing to work with the chairman's office and commission staff to get the office up and running and well positioned for us to incorporate Circular A4 into our rules down the road. Another edit I proposed and the chairman accepted was to add a requirement that like the Office of General Counsel, OEA must confirm that it has reviewed each commission rulemaking to ensure that it's complete before it's released to the public. Doing so will ensure that its work is not ignored or sidestepped on the way to commission consideration. As a practical effect, this can be accomplished through the commission's eBARF signature process. Together, these reforms will give the new office greater involvement in the drafting, editing, and finalizing of the Commission's rules. OEA will play a role on the front end in the original drafting of all cost-benefit analysis and play a role on the back end by signing off on each item. I believe that this heightened level of participation will help ensure that OEA gets get quickly ingrained into the chair, the Commission's procedures and the future chairman have less interested economics and analytics they'll be able to turn a blind eye to uh, as the real burdens that many of our rules impose. I'm confident that OEA will not create additional bureaucracy within the agency. When this item was originally circulated, it was unclear to me what the budgetary impacts of such an office would be. In speaking to the chairman's team, I've been assured that OEA will utilize the current resources of the commission rather than generate an enlarged commission. Overall, today is an important day. We're establishing an office that has potential to take the commission in a more solid and defensible direction. I support this item, and I applaud the chairman and the commission staff for all the good work that went into both the final rules and the report. And I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Today's order might be the most important two-and-a-half-page decision the FCC has issued. Last year, FCC leadership announced a renewed commitment to the role that economic analysis should play in our decision making. We're now codifying that commitment by establishing an Office of Economics and Analytics. This decision follows the recommendation outlined by a staff working group, which first convened nine months ago. That group, as we heard, conducted at least 80 interviews with a broad range of stakeholders, both within and outside the FCC. And they held meetings with every FCC bureau and office that has an economist. Their research found that our talented FCC economists are not uniformly incorporated in our decision making, do not have regular opportunities to offer their opinions on policy matters, and have limited opportunities to collaborate with their peers. That status quo is not something I'm interested in leaving in place. These structural failings only make it more difficult for us to reach decisions that further the public interest. Establishing OEA will help correct these shortcomings. It will ensure that the agency's first-rate economists have a seat at the table and a voice that will be heard. In fact, my vision is that OEA will play a role similar to the agency's Office of General Counsel, which I'm told by many people enjoyed an eight-month golden age <laughs> last year under a prior general counsel. Um, and while, look, it, when I served in that job, the agency's operating bureaus may often be driving towards particular policy outcomes. But OGC functions as the legal conscience of the agency. As a separate office, it enjoys independence from the Commission's policy shops, the chance to develop a specialized body of expertise, and a clearly defined role in our decision-making process. There's no doubt that OGC's feedback ultimately improves and strengthens every agency decision. And OEA will soon be empowered to play a similar role. In addition to enhancing the role that economics will play, I also support the decision to move the auctions division from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau into OEA. While it used to make sense to house the auctions team in WTB, given the important role that spectrum auctions play at the agency, we are increasing our reliance on auctions outside the traditional spectrum context, including in our upcoming CAF 2 proceeding. So it only makes sense to incorporate this group of talented professionals into the new office. The decision to bring even greater economic rigor to agency decision making is one that draws on a long bipartisan tradition. From President Clinton to President Trump, administrations have consistently called for enhancing the role that economic analysis plays in regulatory proceedings. Indeed, former FCC Chairman Janikowski called on the FCC to increase its reliance on economics seven years ago. So I'm pleased that we are moving forward with this idea today. 
And I want to thank Wayne Layton, who served, as we heard, as the team leader of the agency's working group, as well as the rest of the team, uh, the front row back there, uh, Mindy Ginsberg, Sasha Javid, Jay Schwartz, Roy Sherlock, Walt Strack, and Roger Wook for their service and contributions to that body. This item has my full support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. With this decision, the FCC embarks on a big reorganization, and improving the day-to-day functioning of the agency is a laudable goal. I'm hopeful that the new Office of Economics and Analytics will positively contribute to the work of the agency. But I am dismayed that my most basic questions about what this office will entail have not been answered. How many people will the agency have in this office? Are we talking about 50 or 100 or 150? No one will answer. What does it mean to generally shift the functions of certain divisions? Does it mean disbanding some we have today? No one will answer. Will we be hiring new experts for this office or simply be relying on moving around those we have? No one will answer. This is striking. When I last voted on big institutional changes, the reorganization of our field offices, we had exacting numbers. We had very specific information. We knew precisely what these changes would mean for the agency, its staff, and its workload. I think it's irresponsible to vote on a conceptual reorganization, which is what we have here, without frank information about how we will populate this effort. I think this lack of transparency is problematic for the staff of this agency and the work it does. Having been refused this basic information, I dissent. That does not mean that I lack thoughts for what values should guide this agency as we move ahead. First, economic analysis plays an important role in all of our work, but we need to be mindful that we have legal duties that can be at odds with simple cost-benefit analysis. The charge to ensure universal service in our most rural communities where populations are sparse and the cost of infrastructure is high do not easily fit through this prism. Likewise, we have duties to ensure broader access to modern communications through the Americans with Disabilities Act and the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. How we navigate these efforts in light of this office deserves continued attention and vigilance. Second, we need to put a premium on peer review. Rigorous peer review of scientific and economic work has been encouraged and even required since President George W. Bush was in the White House. The FCC should not be relying on studies that do not feature peer review. We need to commit to this course right here and right now because it is unacceptable that so much of the economic work of this agency during the past year was not subject to any standard of peer review. Third, we need more transparency. We need to be honest about how much of the economic data presented to the FCC is advocacy. We want to avoid the risk of relying on numbers masquerading as fact when they simply add up to an effort to champion a desired outcome. There's a simple remedy. Anyone who appears before our oversight committee in the United States House of Representatives must file a truth in testimony disclosure. That disclosure asks for something simple. Who are you representing? Who paid you to be here today? We should ask the same of those who put forward economic studies that are filed in our proceedings. Thank you, Commissioner. When I announced plans to strengthen the role of economics at the FCC, I identified several problems that I thought it was important to address. First, staff economists weren't guaranteed a seat at the policymaking table. Economists too often were sprinkled throughout the agency and were often engaged late in the policymaking process or not at all. Secondly, notwithstanding a rapidly converging marketplace, economists worked in policy silos. Third, Cost-benefit analysis was too often ignored. And fourth, data was not particularly well collected or managed across the agency. Well, today we create the Office of Economics and Analytics, or OEA. I look forward to this change, which is the first official step toward remedying each of the problems I mentioned. 
And notably, this reform has a bipartisan roster of support from people who care about incorporating economic analysis into policymaking. For example, the former head of President Obama's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and I would add my former professor, Cass Sunstein, has cited our plan to create the office, calling it, and I quote, a promising idea from the FCC. And his predecessor in the Bush administration, Susan Dudley, has called the OEA's creation an important first step toward improving the basis on which the FCC makes its decisions. But the plan for achieving our goals goes beyond a mere organizational change. As explained in the very cogent working group report released three weeks ago, we will also adopt new operational practices to make sure that economics does in fact play a larger role at the FCC. For instance, much like at the Federal Trade Commission, the OEA will provide commissioners with a memorandum discussing economic issues implicated by all items placed on circulation and will conduct a rigorous cost-benefit analysis for rulemakings estimated to have over $100 million of economic impact. Behind the scenes, we will also be working hard to integrate OEA staff into the day-to-day policy work of the bureaus. I also look forward to reigniting the the culture of big-picture policy thinking that used to be so common among economists at the FCC. With most economists working closely together in the same office, I expect there will be unique opportunities for intellectual exchanges. And in that environment, I want the Commission's economists to be able to ponder the next set of difficult issues and to consider how economic insights might help address them. White papers represent one way they could do that. Traditionally, our economists have drafted white papers that have been significant drivers of major policy innovations, like the incentive auction and price cap regulation. Since 1990, FCC experts have submitted nearly 90 white papers. Since 2012, that number is zero. Our aim is for this new office to have a culture of inquiry in which long-range policy research is valued as much as bread-and-butter analysis of current proposals and orders. Now, some argue that our commitment to conducting cost-benefit analysis is somehow an attack on the public interest standard set forth in the Communications Act. But thoughtful cost-benefit analysis has historically been a bipartisan tradition. Both the Clinton and Obama administration uh, administrations issued guidelines on this topic, guidelines which the Trump administration's Executive Order 13771 directs agencies to follow. And in 2011, President Obama's Job Council called for separation of economists from program offices, just as we are doing today, so that functions like cost-benefit analysis could be carried out with integrity. Now, additionally, some say that if certain costs or benefits are hard to quantify, we shouldn't even try. But that view deeply misunderstands cost-benefit analysis. Far from rejecting the public interest, interest standard, cost-benefit analysis allows us to intelligibly apply it. And the alternative to trying to quantify costs and benefits is far worse. It's essentially putting your finger in the wind and making it up as you go along. Now, I can see the appeal of this approach for those who might see principles of economics, like provisions of law, as little more than an inconvenient speed bump that one would rather navigate around. But that is no basis for reasoned, evidence-based decision-making by an expert agency. Now, getting to this point required extraordinary effort by our staff because we truly started from scratch. Thank you to those who have worked so hard planning for this office, particularly those on our working group, team leader Wayne Layton, Mindy Ginsberg, Sasha Javid, Jay Schwartz, Roy Sherlock, Roger, uh, Walt Strack, and Roger Wook. Uh, The working group met frequently, as Mr. Stevens pointed out, during 2017, conducting dozens of internal meetings with staff and nearly 50 meetings with outside parties to gain information about how to best design this office. I'd also like to thank Rosemary Harold from the Enforcement Bureau, David Kretsch and Jim Schlichting from the International Bureau, Brendan Holland, Andrew Wise, Mary Beth Murphy, and Michelle Carey from the Media Bureau, Ashley Boisel, Linda Oliver, Bill Richardson, and Ryan Yates from the Office of General Counsel, Dan Daly, Marlene Dorch, Holly Finney, Tom Green, Katura Jackson, Jason Lewis, Mary Kay Mitchell, Lori Senft, Gina Shetler, Larry Shields, and Ellen Standiford from the Office of Managing Director, 
Jerry Ellig, Amaryllis Flores, and Sean Sullivan from the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis. Lisa Folks, David Firth, Deborah Jordan, Lauren Kravitz, and Erica Olson from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Chris Monteith, Kirk Berge, Joe Calishone, Madeline Finley, Trent Harkrader, Lisa Hone, Sue McNeil, Tom Parisi, Eric Ralph, Steve Rosenberg, and Dewana Terry from the Wireline Competition Bureau. And Paul Dari, Alak Mehta, Dana Schaefer, Don Stockdale, Suzanne Tatro, and Margie Wiener from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Suffice it to say that the benefits of your labors far exceed the costs. With that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. I dissent. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner <laughs> Westmorsell. Dissent. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to you both. Uh, Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the sixth item on your agenda will be presented by the Media Bureau. It is entitled Amendment of Section 73.3613 of the Commission's Rules Regarding Filing of Contracts, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative, and Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carey, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good afternoon. The Media Bureau is pleased to present you a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to eliminate decades a decades-old requirement that broadcasters routinely file copies of certain contracts and other documents with the Commission. Joining me at the table are Brendan Holland, Ben Arden, and Chris Clark of the Media Bureau. Chris will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, We present to you this notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on modernizing section 73.3613 of the Commission's rules, which currently requires each licensee or permittee of a commercial or non-commercial AM, FM, television, or international broadcast station to file certain contracts and other documents with the Commission. Since the late 1930s, the Commission has required broadcast station licensees and permittees to submit contracts relating to ownership and control of the stations to the Commission in paper form, the only method of submission available at the time. These paper documents are available to both the Commission staff and the public via the Commission's public reference room. The notice tentatively concludes that the Commission should eliminate the Section 73.3613 paper filing requirement for commercial and non-commercial AM, FM, and television stations and rely instead on the existing public file rules. The Commission's public file rules require licensees and permittees to make these Section 73.3613 documents available for public inspection by either retaining copies of these documents in their public files or maintaining an up-to-date list of such documents in their public files and providing copies to a requesting party within seven days. Thus, the notice tentatively concludes that relying on the existing public file rules with certain modifications will provide the Commission and the public with sufficient access to Section 73.3613 documents for commercial and non-commercial AM, FM, and television stations. For international broadcast stations, which are currently subject to the Section 73.3613 filing requirements but do not have public file obligations like those applicable to other broadcast stations, the notice proposes to eliminate the paper filing requirements but retain the Commission's ability to obtain documents upon request. The notice also seeks comment on other proposed modifications to Section 73.3613, including, among other things, eliminating certain redundant filing obligations and providing enhanced confidentiality protections. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt this notice of proposed rulemaking and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark, we'll now proceed to comments from the bench. Commissioner Clyburn. Some items need little explanation. Today's NPRM is one of them. By proposing to move away from paper copies for certain contracts and other documents involving broadcast stations, we reduce a reported burden on stations and do so without jeopardizing the public's right to review this information. As my fellow commissioners have heard me say in the past, I believe our agency must not forget those who do not have regular access to the Internet. This is particularly critical when it comes to the filing of consumer complaints, EEO recruitment, and other agency functions that involve direct consumer engagement. In the case of the documents required under Section 
I believe the existing public file rules can adequately inform the public. I look forward to reviewing the public comments that follow to ultimately ensure that there are no negative consequences to the public's right to transparency. My thanks to Michelle Carey, Chris Clark, the Media Bureau staff, all of you for your work on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Cl Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> My apologies. Today, the, <coughs> the Commission launches a rulemaking to consider eliminating the requirements that broadcasters file at the Commission certain contracts and other documents that they already make available in their public files. This is common sense and fits nicely with efforts I have pushed over the last number of years to remove unnecessary requirements imposed on American broadcasters. Perhaps these rules at one time served a purpose, but as of last year, only about 500 people, or an average of less than 1.4 people per day, visited the Commission's Reference Information Center where all Section 73.3616 documents were made available. And that figure includes both FCC staff and people viewing other available files. The fact is, as broadcaster files have gone online, this is nothing more than an outdated burden resulting in duplicative information. I look forward to quickly concluding this and other media modernization items in the, that the Commission has teed up in the last number of years. And I thank the Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Today we continue the Commission's effort to modernize our media regulations and eliminate long, outdated paperwork requirements. As we've heard, since the 1930s, the FCC has required broadcasters to mail in paper copies of certain contracts. But in the intervening 70 years, there's been this invention called the Internet. So there's no reason to continue putting broadcasters through the expense of shipping reams of paper to the FCC. Indeed, the transition to online public files only further erodes the need for broadcasters to send in all this pulp. With all this in mind, I offered an idea last week. I suggested that the agency adopt what I call the Dunder Mifflin rule. If the only beneficiary of a regulation is the paper supply industry, the regulation is void. I understand that this idea received high marks, at least from those on my staff that urged me to go the well on it a second time today. So I'm glad I took their advice on that. Um, but I do think we might have our first test case of that rule, so I do want to thank my colleagues for moving so quickly to put it to use. I look forward to the Commission continuing its efforts to eliminate unnecessary filing requirements. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. This is a rulemaking to reduce paper filing requirements. So in that spirit, I am not going to have a paper statement. And instead, we'll just say that this item has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, back in 1939, The Wizard of Oz first hit the silver screen. In that same year, the FCC began requiring broadcast station licensees and permittees to file with us hard copies of certain contracts and other documents relating to station ownership and operation. And many, of course, still consider The Wizard of Oz to be a timeless classic and one of the greatest films of all time. But our broadcast contract filing rules have not aged as gracefully. Uh, paper filings, of course, may have once been the most efficient mechanism for ensuring that these documents were accessible to the FCC and the public. But as been mentioned, in the digital age, this requirement no longer makes sense. And so as a result of the updates in 2012 to our public file rules, Broadcasters are required to make these same documents available via their online public inspection files. Online access, I stress, would continue even if we ultimately eliminate the paper filing requirement. So I'd like to thank the dedicated staff that worked on this notice, Ben Arden, Michelle Carey, Chris Clark, Martha Heller, Brendan Holland, and Mary Beth Murphy of the Media Bureau, and Susan Aaron and Dave Consul from the Office of General Counsel. And thanks for your thanks in advance for uh, your future efforts as we continue to follow the yellow brick road to our destination, a modernized set of media regulations. You had to know I was going to go there as a Kansan. I will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next item on the agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the final item on your agenda today is an Enforcement Bureau action, and Rosemary Harrell, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, because this item is an enforcement-related matter, we're going to switch things around as we traditionally have done. In past cases, that involved the presentation of a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture or NAL at an open meeting. 
As with all open meetings, the Bureau circulated this item to every commissioner more than three weeks ago, but there's a longstanding practice of the agency that we don't publicly disclose the target of an investigation unless and until the commission decides to take enforcement action. So for this item, this means that the agency formally votes on the item, then here's a brief presentation from the Bureau, and then, and only then, proceeds to any statements that the commissioners may have. This process ensures that the target will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. We're going to follow that precedent here, and so we will proceed directly to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn? Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges to be granted, as I expect will be requested in short order. Uh, Ms. Harold, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and for your vote on today's item. A notice of apparent liability for forfeiture addressing a rural health care program service provider's apparent violations of the Communications Act and the Commission's rules. With me at the table is Keith Morgan, Deputy Chief of the Bureau, Rakesh Patel, Director of the Bureau's USF Anti-Fraud Team, and two of its investigative counsels, Mary Beth DeLuca and David Sabotkin. Their extensive investigation led to today's item. Mary Beth will now present it. Thank you, Rosemary. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This notice of apparent liability and order proposes a penalty in the amount of $18,715,405 against Data Connects, a rural health care service provider that received millions of dollars in USF funds in apparent violation of the telecommunication program's competitive bidding and urban rate rules as well as sections 201 and 254 of the Communications Act. Data Connects from 2014 through 2016 apparently paid more than $220,000 to Harrison and Howard Advisors, a company wholly owned by Matthew Howard, who through Healthcare Connect United, a company he also owns, represented rural hospitals in the rural health care program and managed their competitive bidding processes for services. Data Connects held itself out to hospitals as just another service provider, and Healthcare Connect United held itself out as just an independent representative whose loyalty was only to the rural hospitals. However, the evidence shows that Data Connects and Healthcare Connect United apparently developed coordinated plans and strategies designed to target rural health care providers and undermine the basic fairness required of competitive bidding. The evidence shows that Data Connects apparently encouraged hospitals to retain Healthcare Connect United as their consultant prior to the initiation of the competitive bidding process. In many instances, after Healthcare Connect United was retained to help manage the bid process, Data Connects was awarded contracts by these hospitals. The evidence further shows that in at least six instances, Data Connects apparently paid Harrison and Howard Advisors additional sums of money. On contracts, Data Connects was awarded once those hospitals began paying Data Connects for services. The Bureau determined that the rural hospitals were not aware of the financial relationship between Data Connects and Howard and his companies. The urban rates offered by Data Connects, which are used to calculate the amount of USF support a rural health care program participant receives, were apparently forged, false, misleading, and unsubstantiated. The evidence shows that in issuing its urban rate letters, Data Connects relied upon sales quotes purportedly issued by AT&T, but which apparently did not exist. The evidence shows that Data Connects apparently sought supporting documentation for some of its urban rates only after the auditors with the Universal Service Administrative Company requested these documents to support these urban rates. The evidence further shows that Data Connects apparently artificially inf deflated its urban rates to increase the USF funds it received by relying on only portions of the costs associated with these services instead of the total cost of these services. As a result of its apparent conduct, Data Connects was apparently awarded telecommunications contracts through an apparently tainted competitive bidding process and received millions of dollars from the USF to which it was not entitled. 
The Enforcement Bureau supports the Commission's adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeLuca, for the presentation and to all of you for the investigation that led to this result. Uh, Commissioner Cleburne, any comments uh, you care to make? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Today we propose a nearly $19 million forfeiture against a company that thumbed its nose at our agency's rules. Through a web of underhanded deals, kickbacks, and falsified documents, Data Connect apparently took advantage of the rural health care program, the ratepayer, and the public trust. I always say that waste, fraud, and abuse must not be tolerated in any of our universal service programs, which is why this item has my full support. I am also pleased that we include language that will allow us to revoke Data Connect's ETC status if the findings in this notice of apparent liability up are upheld. No company is above the law. And if this company indeed has this level of disregard for our rules, it should not be allowed to receive one more dollar of universal service fund. I would also encourage our staff to work with the relevant state and federal authorities to bring about criminal charges. The salacious conduct in this NAL is a solid factual base that could underpin further prosecution. I thank the hardworking staff of the Enforcement Bureau and in particular the USF Strike Force whose diligent investigative work is on display here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Riley. I'm going to pass on a statement. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. <clears throat> Last month, the Commission proposed several changes to the rural health care program. We sought to incentivize, prior, uh, incentivize prudent spending so that more Americans, regardless of where they live, have access to telemedicine and other advanced health care services. As we noted back then, the rural health care program serves important purposes, but for a number of reasons, the demand for program dollars is now outpacing available funds. As such, the conduct that Data Connects apparently engaged in strikes me as particularly egregious. It appears the company acted to defraud the program by forging documents, misrepresenting pricing information, including to undermine the competitive bidding process. Over the past two years, Data Connects received about $12 million in support from the program. This made it one of the top five funding recipients over that period of time. And recall that demand for program dollars exceeded the cap for the first time last year. So this means that Data Connects' apparently fraudulent scheme might have resulted in providers that are playing by the rules and the potentially millions of consumers they serve losing out on the valuable health care services made possible by the program. Needless to say, we're not taking this conduct lightly. So I support the $18 million proposed fine, and I want to thank the Enforcement Bureau for its diligent work. Having read through the item, I can tell you all put a tremendous amount of effort into this, and I think rightly so. Um, and thank you for prosecuting the case. The item has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Thank you to the Enforcement Bureau for your efforts. And in the interest of getting to lunch, I'm going to say no statement at this time. Lunch is for suckers. <laughs> <laughs> Abuse of the rural health care program is especially egregious, among other reasons, because every dollar stolen through fraud is a dollar not used to bring telehealth services to rural and remote areas. And so I'm pleased that we're taking aggressive action against a company that we believe sought to scam the system. As we've heard, we allege that Data Connects flagrantly violated competitive bidding rules, falsified documents, and manipulated rates to inflate the funding that it received. This conduct deserves a stiff penalty. And if the allegations set forth in the notice of apparent liability are confirmed to be accurate, one will be imposed. And as the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, Data Connects is the second notice of apparent liability that we've adopted in the past year involving the rural health care program. And this case again highlights the need for us to review that program. Just last month, we adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking to explore ways that we can stop waste, fraud, and abuse in this program. This is especially critical because the program is hitting its current funding cap. 
So thank you, as my colleagues have done too, to the excellent uh, staff for the legwork on this case. Uh, from the Enforcement Bureau, Rizwan Chowdhury, Mary Beth DeLuca, Loyan Nagal, Rosemary Harold, Keith Morgan, Rakesh Patel, David Sabotkin, and Jeff Starks. Uh, from the Wireline Competition Bureau as well, Regina Brown, Radhika Kermarker, and Preston Wise. And from the Office of General Counsel, Jim Bird, Billy Layton, Linda Oliver, Bill Richardson, and Sally Stone. We really appreciate your efforts. Uh, no vote is necessary. Uh, sorry, we, we are having voted. So would my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? Commissioner Clyburn? Yes, uh, thank you. I would like to uh, introduce to, and I use the word loosely, spring uh, semester um, interns. Uh, and if they would stand up, they don't want to, but uh, I will ask them to do so, or, or I will lock the door on them. Um, and, you know, <laughs> so I'd like to, I know, it's, it's a rough day. Yeah. Um, I would like to introduce Joseph uh, Karens and, and Pooja Tulani, who have joined my office uh, during the, again, the spring semester. Joseph is a second year law student at American University, and he joins my office if he looks familiar um, after interning in the Enforcement Bureau Investigations and Hearings Division. In his spare time, uh, Joseph likes developing photos taken on his analog camera. Our, yeah, I, I love that. Um, and Pooja is a second year law student also at American U and joins my office after interning in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau Auctions and Spectrum Division. Pooja, proud to say, is a South Carolina native, an active member of Girls on the Run, and in her spare time enjoys traveling, cooking, and trying new fitness classes around D.C. She will soon be my BFF um, because I haven't been doing that lately. So, but I want to welcome the two of them to the office. They are an incredible addition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Carr? Uh, two sets of announcements. I uh, want to start with spring interns as well and then turn to some staff changes in my office. Starting with the interns, I want to introduce uh, two of our spring interns, Angelica Lau and Paul St. Clair. And part of the initiation is you do have to stand up uh, for the entire time that we talk about you. Uh, I'll start with Angelica. She grew up in Honolulu and went to the University of Hawaii for undergrad, where she studied finance and English. And she's now a 2L at George Mason University and already has several internships under her belt. She's interned in the Wireline Competition Bureau, as well as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So welcome to the office. And our second intern is Paul. Paul went to college at Tulane, is now a 2L at my alma mater, Catholic University, where he's enrolled in the communications law program. And before fully committing to a life in telecom, Paul tested the waters by working at Microsoft in their Washington, D.C. office, and he most recently served as an intern at NTIA. We're glad to have both of you for the semester. Thanks. Uh, and then turning to the staff changes, I want to introduce uh, a new member of my team, Will Adams. He also has to go through the process of standing. Um, <laughs> Will has joined my office as legal advisor for wireless issues. Will brings a strong legal and policy background to the job having worked in all three branches of the federal government in addition to the private sector. Uh, after starting his career at the Department of Justice, Will clerked for Judge Timkovich on the Tenth Circuit, and he also served as Chief of Staff to Representative Justin Amash before he became President of Red Door Strategies. Most recently, Will worked in public finance at Morgan Stanley on infrastructure matters. He graduated from Harvard Law School, where he served as President of the Federalist Society and received his undergrad from Georgetown. So we're glad that Will's joined the office. Uh, we're going to really lean on his strategic advice and counsel, uh, particularly as we look to continue to put policies in place on wireless infrastructure. And uh, also, Andy Roan has joined my office as staff assistant. Uh, Andy helped get my office up and running last August, so I'm delighted that she has returned to the office on a full-time basis, uh, although I now owe the Public Safety Bureau something in exchange for this, I, I believe. Since return to the FC in 2014, Andy served in various roles, including most recently as staff assistant to the Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. And in prior FCC service, Andy served as the special assistant to the Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. So we're glad to have her in the office as well. Uh, and finally, one of our advisors has been promoted up and out of my office. So I'll let the chairman uh, speak to that, but I can say she's a standout lawyer, uh, extremely talented, and just want to thank her for her service and let the chairman do the announcement. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Before I get to that, I did want to announce a departure. Uh, Tom Parisi, who I don't know if he's still here. Oh, there he is in the back. 
Uh, so Tom uh, has served at the commission since 2013, so a little over five, almost five years. Uh, he currently serves as chief of staff of the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, one of the critical jobs at the commission as we try to launch these uh, broadband initiatives to close the digital divide. Tom is right at the heart of it, making sure we structure them in such a way to incentivize participation and ultimately get money flowing parts of the country where uh, the, the infrastructure currently is not. Uh, Tom, I understand you're going to the private sector. I just want to say, as we bid you farewell over the past half decade uh, of work, that we are very grateful for your efforts. Aside from the terrific job you have done here, uh, you now leave it to someone else to take up the very heavy mantle of being both hirsute and dapper, which is no <laughs> small thing. Uh, thank you for your service to the commission, and uh, Godspeed in the private sector. Also, I want to announce a few uh, arrivals to our office, Nirali Patel, who, uh, as my colleague uh, recently pointed out, was recently rescued from Commissioner Carr's office, uh, where he served as a legal, she served as a legal advisor on a variety of issues. Uh, prior to that, uh, she served as Deputy Chief in the Competition Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Uh, before joining the Commission in January 2017, uh, she distinguished herself in private practice, uh, counsel in the technology, media, and telecom practice of Hogan Lovells, Wilkie Farr, and Sidley Austin. She graduated uh, summa cum laude from the American University's Law School, received her undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, take that Duke fans, including former Commissioner McDowell. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, she has tainted her sports affiliation by rooting for the Yankees, which I mean, come on, you might as well root for the Patriots if you're going to go that far. Uh, anyway, Nirali is uh, now special counsel in our office, uh, working on a variety of important issues. We're glad to have her on board. Also, Ryan McDonald has joined us uh, for a second stint as an intern for the winter or spring semester. I'm not sure which we're in. He's uh, currently a second-year law student at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason. He hopes to practice in the field of regulatory law upon graduating unless and until he realizes from his experience in our office what that really entails. Immediately before law school, he completed a Bachelor of Arts from Patrick Henry. He grew up moving all around the country because his father was serving the U.S. Navy, but now he and his wife of a year and a half, Christine, have discovered Nirvana, which apparently is in Reston, of all places. In his uh, spare time, this is, uh, this is actually what he told me. I'm not kidding, making this up. In his spare time, he serves as a member of the George Mason Law Review and competes actively in the law school moot court. Um, <laughs> to each his own, I suppose. Um, but uh, no, he's done a terrific job on Moot Court in particular, securing two consecutive intramural titles, and will be representing George Mason at the ABA's National Appellate Advocacy Competition in February. He and his wife also just completed their first Tough Mudder 12-mile run last fall. Uh, I just learned that his mother was a mudder, and his father was a mudder, <laughs> for those of you who are Seinfeld fans. So anyway, they hope to do more in the future. Um, so those are the arrivals in our office. I also want to recognize some of the commission staff who recently uh, were given an award, the Employee of the Year Award. Every, each year, a Chapter 209 of the National Treasury Employees Union, as well as uh, the uh, uh, management of the FCC with approval of the chairman, uh, gives Employee of the Year awards to members of the FCC staff who have done terrific work. And this year, we're very pleased to be able to give uh, that award to a number of individuals whose names and offices I will read here. Uh, Murtaza Nasafi from the uh, Wireline Telecommunications Bureau, Mark Colombo from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Anderson Bennett from the Enforcement Bureau, the Los Angeles Field Office, and then a number of employees from the Office of the Secretary, um, Secretary Dorch's home. Uh, Rosabelle Atkins, Alita Bowers, Katura Jackson, Jason Lewis, Brian Payne, and Angela Robin Robinson. Uh, now, the individuals and team recipients will share in a $10,000 award, none of which goes to any of the commissioners, I would add. But I just want to thank them for all the hard work. Just to give an example, the folks who work in the office of the secretary, you might not know what they do, but you definitely appreciate their efforts because the fact that you're able to see commission items, the fact that you're able to go on E-Class or ECFS and the like, the secretary's office does terrific work managing that process, making sure that the paper that we – uh, circulate and adopt is able to be presented in a publicly uh, uh, accessible way. So thank you to all of the recipients, and uh, I want to recognize them for their hard work over the past year. And I think a round of applause would be suitable for that. <laughs> Among the other responsibilities of the Office of the Secretary is for the Secretary herself to announce the next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission, which I will now ask her to do. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, February 22nd, 2018. That's we are adjourned. <laughs> Bless you.
Hi, good afternoon. Please be seated or take your conversations outside. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chairman Pai for the press conference. Uh, thanks, Tina, very much. I'll just have a few comments and then be happy to take your questions. Uh, today, the FCC took a major step forward in, in improving our wireless emergency alert system. Many in the public safety community have said that wireless emergency alerts need to be more precisely targeted to areas where there is an emergency. When deadly wildfires ignited in Northern California last October, for in instance, some local authorities chose not to push out a wireless alert. They cited fears that the alert would also have gone out to people who are not in harm's way, potentially provoking a mass exodus that could clog the roads and prevent those actually in danger from reaching safety. With today's action, the Commission has addressed this problem and made an important life-saving tool even more effective. These new rules will require wireless carriers to deliver alerts that more precisely match the affected area. This will encourage local officials to use these alerts during emergencies. It will also encourage Americans to take mobile alerts more seriously, since folks know that any alert they see relates to an emergency that's in their vicinity. The new rules will also require alerts to be preserved on consumers' phones for 24 hours, which will make it easier for them to access and use the information contained in those alerts. I'm very pleased that we gained bipartisan support for these improvements, among other items that we adopted today. Uh, and our action on WIA today once again demonstrates this Commission's strong commitment to protecting the safety of the American people. And with that, I would be uh, happy to take the questions that you have. Monty? Uh, I was wondering if there is any possibility of the, if the FCC has the authority or is going to seek to compel the Hawaii alerting official who wouldn't speak to them to speak to them further? Or? I can't speak to the particular further investigative steps that we intend to take, uh, but we are hopeful that we can secure uh, as much cooperation from as possible from anyone involved with this incident. Uh, it is critical for us to be able to act upon facts, for us to be able to gather all of those facts. And so I'm very grateful to our staff uh, for getting what information they could from is the. There, is there any contemplation of enforcement action or anything coming from this? Uh, again, I can't. Con I can't comment on further investigative steps that we may or may not take. Thank you. Hi, Kelsey Hello. Gross, Law Three Sixty. Um, I'm just wondering, wondering if you could comment any further on the FTC nominees and how they might um, set a, you know, enforcement trajectory uh, since the FCC. Since the FTC, or sorry, since the FCC has handed over, um, you know, some of its powers in that regard after the net neutrality proceeding. Oh, well, sorry, I put out a statement about the nominees. Uh, they are a very impressive array of individuals, both individually and as a group. I think they bring a wealth of experience uh, to the commission, or would if they were confirmed. And I look forward to working with them on some of the areas uh, where we uh, have joint interests. Uh, so, for example, I targeted robocalls as one area where uh, we share a consumer protection function. Uh, we exercise our responsibilities in different ways, but we share that interest. Uh, similarly, with respect to promoting competition, uh, there are areas where we can collaborate as well. So I think um, I'm excited to see uh, what the, uh, the new team brings to the table. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the outgoing chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Maureen Olhouse, and she's done a fantastic job, uh, both previously as a commissioner, but especially now over the last year as the acting chair. Uh, she's shown leadership, I think, in, uh, across a variety of issues, and uh, I think she leaves some very big shoes for Mr. Simons to fill. Um, if yeah. I may ask a follow-up, have you had any discussions about how that interplay is going to work? Because it does sound like there's going to be some level of coordination between the FCC and the FTC. Well, again, I haven't uh, talked to those nominees since they're still going through the confirmation process. Uh, if and when uh, that process plays out, I would imagine uh, we will be in touch about those issues. Hi, Chairman Pai. Hi. Um, so Commissioner O'Reilly mentioned um, with the uh, Hawaii preliminary report um, that he thinks FEMA bears uh, much of the responsibilities going forward to uh, address this situation. What are your thoughts on the division between FEMA and the FCC going forward? 
Well, I would certainly refer you to the Public Safety Bureau, which uh, you know, obviously has been handling this issue. And I think uh, Chief Folks put it well in her answer to Commissioner O'Reilly that uh, look to the extent that the FCC is one of the players uh, that has uh, historically pr- uh, exercised somewhat of a convening role to get all the stakeholders in one place, that I think it's helpful for us to be able to provide a forum for conversation so we can explore some of the issues that have arisen and try to identify if there are ways that we can take action. Uh, certainly, I support the efforts of the Public Safety Bureau. They've done a tremendous job conducting this investigation in a very, very short order. I mean, this alert only happened uh, 17 days ago. Mm -hmm. Two and a half weeks later, thanks to the great work of Mr. Wiley and Mr. Kane, uh, we have the facts, uh, a large number of the facts that surrounded this event. We're able to target what went wrong and hopefully draw some preliminary preliminary ideas about where we can move forward. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's all thanks to the FCC's hard work, and I would hope that we have a seat at the table, wherever that table might be in Washington. Thank you. Lynn Stanton, Tara Daly. You mentioned that today's enforcement action was the second in this particular area uh, within a year. Do you have some specific ideas as to what kind of changes might need to be made to prevent it rather than have to deal with it after the fact? That is certainly the goal. Uh, we want to deter uh, fraud from happening in the first place. And I don't want to prejudge uh, where the record is going to take us. As I mentioned, we just uh, issued, or we just adopted and issued the notice of proposed rulemaking recently. So we're going to let the public try to give us some input on where some of the vulnerabilities might be, and then to see if there are any actions that we can take consistent with our statutory authority to plug those gaps, uh, to make sure that we are, uh, as we always should be, when it comes to the Universal Service Fund, wise stewards of federal funds. Thank you, David. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, On the 5G memo controversy, you were pretty clear yesterday uh, that you don't see a role for the federal government as a builder of networks. Um, But I'm wondering if you agree with people who say that there is validity to the broader concern that China and other countries uh, may be developing 5G technology faster than the United States, than the industry in the United States. I'm wondering what you make of that uh, broader, kind of more abstract well, I've consistently said that we want the United States uh, to be the uh, leader in 5G technology. We want capital to be spent here. We want innovation to happen here. We want the entrepreneurial spirit to thrive here. And that's part of the reason why over the last year uh, in my chairmanship, we've aggressively moved forward to make sure that we can push Spectrum into the commercial marketplace to allow innovators to experiment. We've explored ways to promote uh, wireless infrastructure rules uh, that will make it easier to deploy the next generation networks that are going to look very different from the uh, 4G and uh, previous uh, networks that we've had. And I think the private sector has responded to that. We now see companies that are engaged, they're making massive investments into 5G. Some of them are actively conducting trials in the United States. And so clearly this is not uh, an area where we can sit on our laurels. And I'm proud to say that over the last year we haven't. And a little more specifically, where do you think all the activity you just described stacks up against other markets in, around the world? Well, I think we are leading uh, the world in 5G, but uh, it's, there's no easy way to quantify this, but I, what I will say is if you judge it from the priority we place on this issue as well as the activity that we have conducted in order to meet that priority, that I think uh, we are doing what we can to assert U.S. leadership in 5G. Okay. Sure. Margaret McGill with Politico. I'm wondering if you or members of your staff have had any conversations with the White House about the State of the Union tonight and also what you want to hear from the President. Uh, I have not, not to my knowledge. Uh, we uh, haven't. And uh, in terms of what I would like to hear from the president, I will certainly defer to the president as to what he chooses to say. Uh, it's been reported, of course, that infrastructure will feature as a part of that, and I would uh, reiterate uh, what I've said in the past with respect to the digital aspect of infrastructure, which I think is very important. Thanks. Uh, Chairman Pai, you got a letter from uh, members of the intelligence committees in December about Huawei and concerns generally about Chinese companies and U.S. telecommunications which was also addressed in this Axios story. Can you speak generally to concerns about Chinese companies entering the U.S. telecommunications market, and do you think there are proper safeguards to ensure that China doesn't conduct espionage through our networks? What I will say is that we have, of course, received the letter uh, from the committee, as you mentioned. Uh, We are uh, considering that letter, and uh, we'll respond appropriately. We work with uh, various federal partners when it comes to national security on an ongoing basis, uh, and I can't comment on the nature of that consultative effort, but I will say that it is uh, robust and ongoing. Uh, Per Representative uh, Pallone's uh, letter request, the GAO plans to look look at the reliability of some of the advanced net neutrality public comment. 
Uh, what would you say about uh, how much you relied on the public comment in making the decision? What are you doing to ensure the um, reliability going forward? And do you think any legislation is needed in that regard, reliability and verification-wise? Uh, in terms of uh, what we relied upon, uh, you can see for yourself in the text of the order that we adopted uh, that we relied on uh, what the courts have consistently called substantial evidence, that are comments that substantively and meaningfully grappled with the issues that we uh, teed up in the notice of proposed rulemaking. And so uh, in that regard, our decision-making uh, process relied on uh, those comments that were, uh, in, that were in the record that were substantive. Uh, going forward, uh, we're, you know, we will, as I said before, uh, consider ways, uh, if there are any reforms that are necessary to the process. But uh, as far as the December order goes, I'm confident that uh, we uh, relied on what the courts have called substantial evidence. This is kind of terra incognita. I mean, is legislation needed not just for your agency but for other agencies to, to prevent uh, or ensure the reliability I mean, to the extent we're talking about legislation, that is something that's within the purview of Congress, so I wouldn't uh, uh, prescribe to them what they should or shouldn't do uh, with respect to amending the Communications Act or uh, passing other laws in that regard. Ted Johnson from Variety. Uh, Chairman Pai, were you aware, uh, referring to the Axios story on mm -hmm. 5G, were you aware that this was something that was under consideration, and have you uh, expressed your concerns directly to officials in the Trump administration or the White House? Uh, what I'll say is that uh, we uh, regularly uh, consult with federal partners on issues that uh, are at the intersection of uh, security and communications networks, and I can't comment uh, beyond that. Hi, Mr. Pai. Todd Shields, uh, Bloomberg News. What should happen now to this 5G plan we heard about over the weekend? Well, it's up for, to others to decide what happens uh, to it. I've uh, I put out the statement uh, yesterday, and I stand by that statement. Thank okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great January. Thanks, everyone. We'll transition now to the Bureau press conference with my colleague, Mark. Okay, greetings. Um, let's just go through by bureaus. Are there any questions regarding the uh, public safety presentation or the wireless emergency alerts? Monty, okay, public safety. Uh, yeah, I just had some questions about the Hawaii thing. Um, do you guys have any comment on the question I asked uh, Chairman Pai, whether this could lead to some sort of enforcement action? I mean, would, is, is that even applicable to something like this? I don't know if you guys have the authority to do that. or We don't comment on whether or not enforcement okay. is, a, is a possibility. Uh, and then I was also wondering, uh, specifically in the timeline that uh, you gave of what happened, uh, you, you said that the call, the message that was used to trigger this alert was not the normal message that's used, or at least it didn't comply with their SOP. Can you, do you have any reason for why they used a different phone message that time? The supervisor that created the message I was of the belief that exercise, exercise, exercise was sufficient to communicate to the warning officers that this was an exercise. And, and that's different than what's normally done in those circumstances in other states. Uh, I, I can't speak to what other states would do. Okay. Fair enough. Can I follow up on that? Sure. Okay. So you, so the, how was the language different than the normal script for a drill? Was it just the use of the phrase, this is not a drill, or is it? The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency considered the actual script that they would receive during an actual alert or during a test to be confidential. Okay. And so we're not in a position to share that. Okay. But was it significant? Can you give us a sense of how much different it was than the normal drill script? The, the, the supervisor used the wrong source material. She used an EAS alert as opposed to oh, the script. Gotcha. So obviously you, the person would normally immediately identify this as a drill based on the script, right? To, to, I, I can't say what, what they would normally do, but the, the right. intention was for it to communicate that it was a drill. And it, is there any way for you guys to be able to ascertain who's right here. You have the other employees who said they remember hearing exercise, exercise, exercise. The, the, the employee who issued the alert di is not talking to you, but says they, he or she doesn't remember that phrase. Is there any other, any other way of 
of ascertaining who's right here? The, the Bureau's investigation is ongoing, and that's going to be something we're going to look at. Okay. I have, a, I have one. So um, the EAS and the W and WEA, WEA, those are two different systems, right? Yes. And then is one under FEMA and the other under FCC, or is it, is it both joint? The way it works is that the FCC has authority over the communication service providers that participate in the EAS, the emergency alert system, which is the broadcast-based system that broadcasters, cable operators, satellite, radio, and TV participate in. The FCC also oversees the part, the, the part of WIA that involves the participating commercial wireless carriers. FEMA over has an inter, what they call an integrated public alert and warning system, and they administer that. That is the system that alert originators send uh, would send their alerts through that system, and then that system, and then the, the alert gets sent to the communication service providers over a secure pathway. It's that distribution from the communication service providers that we oversee. The front end of it is the alert origination, that is the state and local government. Okay, thank you. So it, generally, in answer to your question, there are different pieces and different organizations oversee each of those different pieces. Hi, Kelsey Gervis with Law360. I was wondering if you could possibly clarify where we're at with the um, capability for longer alerts and clickable links. It seems like, if I remember correctly, this was approved already, but it hasn't fully been rolled out. Is that correct? If the rules were adopted, come in with the deadlines. September 2016. So, thanks. The, the, the rules were adopted in September 2016, and the requirement to support 360 character alerts is effective May 2019. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anything further on these items? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next are the, is the uh, Connect America Fund items. Are there questions for on the Connect America Fund? Uh, Lynn, okay. Uh, so I guess wireless and wireline. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my, my question wasn't on that. I'm sorry about that. I have one. Okay. I have one. I have one. I have one. Okay. I have one. Okay. I have one. Just, uh, you know, so uh, the high cost program and the USF, uh, it's about $4 billion a year, I believe. And uh, is that a fair estimate of how much is going to rural broadband, or is it a subset of that? Do you know offhand? This is, not this is sort of a little outside the scope of the, the, the auction sort of, I'm sorry, trying The auction to, has trying a budget. To put it in an order of magnitude. So this is $2 billion over a decade, but it's it's about $4 billion, right, going from the high-cost fund. What's the $2 billion, $2 billion over 10 years um, is the budget for the Connect America Fund um, Phase two auction. Then there are other... Um, it's kind of funding streams within the high cost it's about, program. It's about four and a half billion a year for the entire high cost program. Some of which goes to areas served by other types of carriers, smaller rural telephone companies. Some of which goes to support mobile broadband and voice. So that's and would, four and a half billion a year, and this is about two hundred. Is it fair to say that most of the four and a half goes to rural, or is it more? You know, is it is it you know not the lion's share? I mean, all of that money goes to what we consider high-cost areas. They aren't there's, – there's not necessarily a defi definition of rural, but they are high-cost areas where the cost to provide service is, okay. is higher. And so – A lot of that would be that. rural, to be fair to say. Okay, thanks. Monty? Uh, I, I got a uh, colleague sent me in a question, so bear with me here. Did the FCC give potential bidders, particularly small providers, more flexibility in bidding on census block groups than was in the draft? Um, the commission had proposed in the comment PN using um, census block groups for bidding, and so pa basically packaging the 
um, grouping the eligible census blocks within a census block group um, together for um, purposes of bidding, and that is um, the decision that um, as was adopted in this procedures public notice. Thank you. I, I hope that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything okay. further on this item? Okay. Uh, the next is the uh, economics office. Are there questions on the uh, economics office um, item? Yes, Lynn has a question. Stanton Tiardelli. Commissioner O'Reilly referred to something called the e-barf, and I was just wondering what that was. I mean, yes, yes, we're all going to laugh about it, but we'll, but I assume that's a real thing. He wasn't just making a joke? or it, It's not made up. It's a commission uh, release form uh, when agenda items are being voted and released. It's e is electronic, and it's the Bureau. So, what's the A? Agenda, agenda release form. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> Hi, Kelsey Griffiths with Law 360. I was just wondering um, if you do have any more details about how many economists work across the FCC bureaus and whether all of those economists will be pulled into the same office now. Sure. I don't know the number off the top of my head agency-wide, but uh, there will be, for this office, it should be about just under 100 people probably moving, which is economists... A few lawyers from the auctions division, uh, a few technologists, but it's mostly economists. Thank you. Sure. Anything further? Okay. That's easy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think any questions on the media bureau items? Okay. Uh, finally, the last item was the uh, enforcement bureau action. Any? Will any have a question on that? Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> Lynn Stanton Tiardelli, um, could you explain a little bit more about what the company was doing with the pricing and how that was affecting what it was getting. I thought I heard Mary Dilka say that it was deflating, which didn't make sense to me, but maybe I misheard. Uh -huh. I can describe that process a little bit. The way that the reimbursements from the Universal Service Fund to the service providers work is that a rural provider um, is generally, the cost of providing services in a rural area is going to be higher than the cost of providing the same services in an urban area. The urban area, the, the differential between those two, the urban rate cost versus the rural rate cost, is reimbursed by or can be reimbursed by the Universal Service Fund through the uh, Universal Service Administrative Company. In this instance, we found evidence that Data Connects was artificially keeping that urban rate cost lower so that it could increase that differential. Anything further on this one? Okay, I think that ends the bureau portion. Uh, I see Commissioner O'Reilly is here, so or Commissioner and Commissioner Carr. Questions for us on this fine day? Oh. On the five G proposal or leak plan that came out Sunday. Had either one of you ever heard about this before, or do you think this is something that's been taken seriously by the White House or is still being taken seriously? Uh, to answer your first question, no. As the first I heard of it was the story I saw, yeah. as you saw. Yeah. So as the first I had had any conversation, and I've had no conversations with the White House since then, so I don't know what they're planning to do with it. It didn't seem like it went very well uh, yesterday, <laughs> but I'll, I'll defer to them. Uh, yeah, I don't have any input as to where it is in the, the White House's decision-making process. Like I said, um, I haven't had any input in developing the idea. Sure. And can you just speak to all the, the sort of initial hurdles? I mean, I know you both put out statements, but in terms of the massive costs, the government have you know this, the issue of would the government even have enough spectrum to do this on its own? 
Well, the ban that the document is that I saw that's been in the public was indicating is the 37042, which I've been spending a ton of time trying to free up uh, for commercial services. So there, whether that's sufficient uh, for running a full 5G network is unclear. Uh, we're trying to work through those issues as it relates to 3.5 and partnering, you know, trying to find spectrum in 3.1 space, uh, and then obviously 3.7 to 4.2, so trying to make a full plate of spectrum available in the mid-band for a 5G-type play or other type services. Uh, but so whether that one band could be enough, I, I don't know what how they envisioned it and have had no conversations with them. Uh, it depends on how robust you want certain things and how much capability you want, uh, depend how much spectrum you may need at, at that particular uh, spectrum band. Who's, who, uh, well, my team will come back. Commissioner uh, Rosenworth's little six-dot Hawaii thing has brought up a bunch of reforms she wants for EAS procedures, uh, maybe reforms is strong, but she wants best practices and things that do you have any uh, comment on some of the stuff she's proposing? Well, I would just um, highlight there is a statute enacted by Congress in 2016, signed by the President, that governs a lot of the things that, that she was indicating that she would like to see happen. They already have those requirements. They're run, uh, supposed to be run by FEMA. If they aren't occurring, that's a question you should ask them on what, what what's happening. But there are best practices. There's coordination. There's outreach. All of that part that Chief Folks talked about, the beginning part of the horse, where the seems to be the back end of the horse, uh, so. Uh, but uh, but so the front end of the part is is all the things that that's the FEMA portion of the equation that I was trying to get at. And so, well, she, the, the ideas that she's put forward, I, I think, are already in statute. And well, if they're not being done sufficiently, that's uh, for Congress to look at or other folks to to examine. In my opinion. Uh, I have nothing. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworth was there. I'm sure she can, can speak to it. Uh, commissioners, what do you see as the FCC's next role, uh, next steps uh, for enabling telehealth uh, innovations? So we have some funding issues we've got to work through. In my opinion, we have to deal with the cap that we've reached on rural health care. Uh, that, that is being examined by the commission right now. I've highlighted my viewpoints on, on the good work that's being done in Alaska. I don't want to see that being trampled on as we try and figure out, but I'm also cognizant of what the budget uh, implications are for, for raising the cost there and, and looking to see if we can't offset that elsewhere. So I think the, that is probably front and center. Some of the other pieces that I've talked about globally is how do we deal with the fact that we're only one component of telehealth. We, you know, we may provide uh, rural connectivity uh, but a lot of the telehealth pieces are done by other agencies, and we don't see any. We're, we're spending, uh, people are expecting a lot out of the FCC in terms of the dollar figure, uh, but we don't see any of the savings part in terms of health care reform, in terms of you know savings you can get from telehealth, telemedicine type per, uh, services. So I, I think that at some point there's going to have to be a larger conversation on how these things work together, and not you know not everything is going to come from us, uh, and certainly we got to either get credit for some of it, or we've got to address the budgetary issues because it's going to continue. Uh, we're We've reached the cap. It's only going to continue to bang uh, up against that uh, as we go forward, in my opinion. Yeah, we had that item uh, last month that started looking at some of the issues with the rural health care program. I want to see that proceeding continue to develop, see the comments there. Um, you know, more broadly, you know, we also have to look, as I've talked a lot about, how do we, you know, remove these barriers, make it less costly for providers to deploy in these areas? I think this is where potentially 5G could come in. Uh, some fixed wireless solutions, and so we have to continue to reform our infrastructure deployment rules to make it less costly to provide services in these communities. Thank you guys. All right, we stumped you all. Have a good lunch. Thanks. <laughs> and then there was me. <laughs> uh, some of the proposals that you're suggesting based on this Hawaii thing a little further. You, you've said a few times that you want to uh, combine the daisy chain and the uh, and the FEMA alert. Can you explain what, what exactly you mean by that? Sure. Um, I saw this coming. Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have some stronger ties to Hawaii, I think, than some of my colleagues in that I had the privilege of working for Senator Inouye for some time, so I had the ability to speak with people who I long ago worked with in the aftermath of this attack. 
And it was just harrowing to hear their stories. It is impossible to imagine what they went through during that 38-minute period. And coming out of those discussions, we started to look at what we could do here at the FCC. It's true that there are state responsibilities, there are local responsibilities, and there are national responsibilities. And our jurisdiction does not extend to cover them all. It's also clear that our colleagues at FEMA through the IPAWS system have a lot of authority in this area. And that relates to what I've described before as the daisy chain system, which has been used as an older process that is different from the alert aggregator system they have, which is more modern. But I think the most important thing is this. The FCC has a requirement that states file EAS plans with this agency. They have to annually confirm those plans, and they have to report to us when they make changes in those plans. What we should do right now is use that fact to compel states to follow best practices that we identify as the result of our investigation so that this never happens again. The fact that states have an obligation to file those plans with this agency is important. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure they're updated to reflect the kinds of best practices that will prevent this from happening again. Have you gotten any, any reaction to that proposal from the chairman's office? It's my hope that if I keep repeating it, I will remind everyone that, in fact, that obligation exists. And it is a useful way to try to compel change. And we see what just happened. I think that's something we should all want to do. I know, obviously, it's not your call as to whether Congress changes the law or not, but what do you think about Senator Schatz's proposal that we, the government takes the responsibility for nuclear alerts out of the hands of state officials and makes it a federal responsibility? I think Senator Schatz has been doing a terrific job trying to draw attention to this issue and looking at complex questions like the one you just described. I think the most important thing for Hawaii right now is that we commit to getting this done in short order. You know, disasters like this, we can forget about them over time, and we cannot do that for the people of Hawaii or anyone else who might be impacted by a false alert in the future. So I think the most important thing that happens right now is that we actually commit to getting something done in short order. Hi, Kelsey Griffiths at Law360. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some more details about the roadblocks that you encountered in the creation of the Office of Economics. We asked a lot of questions of our colleagues. They refused to answer them. We asked how many people would be moved in this agency. They refused to tell us. We asked what divisions might be shut down or collapsed. They refused to tell us. We asked the count of individuals who would be moved and what would be the broader impact on the rest of the agency and its responsibilities. They refused to tell us. At some point, you have to acknowledge that it's irresponsible to vote on a substantial reorganization without knowing its details. The last major reorganization of this agency involved the closure of field offices. I voted on the closure of those field offices. We knew down to a person what the impact would be on this agency. I do not understand why they refuse to support the other offices and supply that information right now. I think it's important when we make conceptual changes that we actually understand how we're going to populate them. Moreover, I think going forward, it's important that we look at the tasks that this new office is assigned and make sure that when we look at economic analysis, it is subject to peer review. Whatever we rely on should be subject to peer review. It's also important that we do something that our colleagues at the House of Representatives require, which is with every piece of testimony that is filed, you need to say who supported it, who spent for your advocacy today. That's an easy thing for us to file when we serve here at the agency, but they require that of anyone with any association with industry. And I think going forward, the Office of Economic Advocacy needs to require that. And just to follow up on that, is that normal anywhere else in the FCC? I do not believe it is, but I think that normally when we have, for instance, legal authorities come in and advocate 
on behalf of a client, they make clear who that client is as a matter of regular practice. We should require the same of any economic analysis that is submitted to this agency. That is a basic matter of transparency, and I hope it's a principle that the office will apply going forward. Thank you. Lynn Stanton, Tierra Daily. For, on the um, Office of Economic Economics and Analysis, um, just a few moments ago, staff up there told us that it was going to be 200 people moved into this new yeah, office. Yeah, I Are overheard you? that. They did not tell me, despite the many, many times we asked. So um, so I was wondering, when you asked, do you ask Chairman Pai directly, and he relays the Is that the process, or are you allowed to ask staff directly? Well, my staff asked directly and repeatedly and was not told the answer. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tara Jeffries, Bloomberg Law. Uh, what do you think the commission's role should be, um, especially with regard to other federal agencies in uh, advancing telehealth? Oh, I think there are extraordinary things we can do with telehealth. I will agree with my colleagues, though, who spoke before. We started a fairly substantial effort here late last year to look at our rural health care mechanism and try to understand what changes should be made to modernize it and what changes should be made to make sure that our budget works for the world that we're in today. And I am looking forward to the comments that are being filed and every good idea that comes into our record. And we're still waiting on those comments right now, but I'm looking forward to reading them. I, uh, I got one more from a colleague. Um, you've said that you want the FCC to schedule a new spectrum auction, but Chairman Pai and others have said the FCC can't legally deposit funds in a bank due to certain legal obstacles uh, without a congressional fix. Does that prevent the FCC from having a new auction, or is there a, a way they could do that without that fix? Here's what I know. The FCC was conducting its 600 megahertz auction last year. We found a way around that hurdle to the extent it exists then. We should find a way around that hurdle right now. It's imperative we do that if we want to lead the world in the next generation of 5G services. Sitting down and cowering and pretending that there's some kind of financial bank issue that's preventing for us from moving ahead is ridiculous. If we want to lead the world, we have got to schedule an auction. South Korea has already scheduled its 28 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz auctions. We're sitting here waiting in the wings. And at a minimum right now, we could identify a target date and put out proposed auction rules and seek comment on them. But we're not doing that. And I think our failure to do that is a choice to cede our leadership to other nations. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go finally have lunch. Thank you all. <laughs>